It's time for Twig This Week in Google. Paris Martineau is here. Uh, Jeff Jarvis is here. We've got a special guest, Stephen B. Johnson. You may know him from his PBS television show, his books and podcasts. But he's also the guy who helped Google design a new tool for writers called Notebook LM. We'll get the inside details. And then I will admit that I was bamboozled, hornswoggled, fooled, if you will, by the Gemini demo. Yes, I have to say it. Paris was right. That's all next on This Week in Google. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twig. This Week in Google, episode 746, recorded Wednesday, December 13th, 2023. Huffin Hazelnut. This Week in Google is brought to you by Discourse, the online home for your community. Discourse makes it easy to have meaningful conversations and collaborate anytime, anywhere. Visit discourse.org slash twit and get one month free on all self-serve plans. And by Fastmail. Reclaim your privacy, boost productivity, and make email yours with Fastmail. Try it now free for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. It's time for Twig this week in, well, actually this week it's actually in Google. <laughs> the show where we cover Google news, internet news, media, journalism, everything uh, on our minds. Paris Martineau is here from the information. Hello, Paris. I think this week we could have the most Google we've ever had. It's it's a new record. It's possible. The most yeah. Google it's ever. huge. Wow. Guys. All Google all the time. Uh, Paris it's like it's is, in the name or something. <laughs> Paris's signal is uh, there in the uh, lower third if you have a scoop. Still working that story that you got from the last scoop? Yes, Yay. definitely. Send nice. me tips. Send her Don't reach tips. out just to tell me that uh, computers have advanced a lot since the 70s. Uh, that is not, <laughs> in fact, do that? the tip. Did somebody do that? Someone did. <laughs> yeah. It's Listen, probably, a really good somebody bit. somebody our age, Leo. <laughs> you know, I mean, old guys. You whippersnapper. I, <laughs> I've heard that these computer things are a bit more advanced than they used to make them. <laughs> Look into that. Also with us, the fabulous professor, Leonard Tao professor, for one, what, one more day? Leonard, uh, two, yeah. Two yeah, more days. The Leonard basically. Tao professor for journalistic innovation at the fabulous Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Newmark. The City University of New York. We're going to have to retire the Craig Newmark singers. No, we can't do that. So we you got to go to work for some other Craig Newmark joint. Yes. Okay. Yes. Also well, we author of the- make it like- Honorary. Craig Newmark's friend. Friend of yes. Craig, 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 Craig Newmark. Craig Newmark. Yeah. <laughs> Could be good. Uh, he's also the author of the Gutenberg Parenthesis at GutenbergParenthesis.com and his newest book, Magazine, scored rave reviews from Paris Martineau, who has, in fact, written for a magazine. So she should it's know. It's a great book. Yeah. Thank you. It's thank adorable you, thank and you. portable. Adorable yes, and portable. So That's what my parents used to call me. Uh, we have a special guest, thanks to Mr. Uh, Jarvis. Jeff, do you want to introduce Stephen? Oh, Stephen B. Johnson, uh, famed author of what, 13 books, Stephen? 13 books. Uh, 13 14. books. Stephen, uh, here. Stephen and I go way back when Stephen Forever. founded Feed. Oh. And then it got it got mixed in with uh, plastic. I was on the board of plastic because my employer at the time, the new houses, invested in it. Don't blame me for the fact that it doesn't exist anymore, uh, nor Stephen. Uh, it was a nice try in the early days of the Internet. And then Stephen's been doing all kinds of fascinating things and uh, then got hired by Google as editorial director of Notebook LM, which I'm just uh, fascinated that that title exists anywhere within 40 miles of Mountain View. Um, so, uh, I visited Stephen, as you all know, from the show, and we talked about Notebook LM before, but I couldn't really talk about it completely, but it came out publicly on Friday. So Stephen said he would come on the show when it was out. And so here he is. You've seen Stephen perhaps on uh, the PBS series, Extra Life and how we got to now. He is in fact, the most famous person we've ever had on this show. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we are all thrilled to have you, Stephen. Thank you. And, uh, so you're not a coder, you're an editorial director. 
Yeah, it's it's a, a bespoke position uh, that um, I had to kind of help invent uh, to describe what I was doing there. So, you know, the the backstory of this is basically that um, I had been interested in, in, you know, using software to help with the writing and research process for, for writing my books um, and everything else. Uh, for years, I mean, it predates when I met Jeff. Like, I mean, I, I was kind of got obsessed with this stuff when I was in college in a way, um, when, when the old Apple app, uh, HyperCard came out for the Mac in like 1988 for old timers may remember this. Um, and so as I'd been kind of writing the books, I always had a little bit of a side hustle in writing about the tools I was using to write the books. Um, and so I'd, I'd written a lot about this tool I used called Devon Think to organize all my oh, yeah. quotes from my research and, Long time and then a user. lot about Scrivener. Scrivener, um, yep. Mm-hmm. Wrote a bunch of books with. Um, and so there was this kind of separate interest in, in tools for thought, as Howard Rheingold famously called them um, years ago. And so when at some point in, in the late spring of 2022, I got it. Okay. okay. Like, You're using a Macintosh and you did a thumbs up and, uh, and the Macintosh oh, yeah. just <laughs> gave us a thought yeah. bubble of thumbs up. To just, <laughs> in case that. people yeah. think, I, wow, I, he's magic. Sorry. That's, that's yeah. what's going on there. <laughs> it's a Zoom thing now, right? <laughs> no, that's, I Mac, that's a Mac, I think, unless it's uh, also a that's Zoom thing. Yeah. All right. I'll try to keep my gestures to a minimum. And just whatever you do, um, don't do the... Yeah, uh, what if you do this? this? Yeah, yeah, what yeah. If you, yeah. Is that rock that... that, that you can't do that gesture, Jeff. We know that. <laughs> so I got... Well, I got this, this or this. <laughs> I got, <laughs> we can just do gestures the whole time. Um, <laughs> I, got, I got kind of a cold email from um, a wonderful guy who was at Google at the time named Clay Bavor, who had just started Google Labs, which is kind of had been rebooted inside of Google as a new version of labs. There was an older version of labs before. And he basically was like, look, you know, I've been reading your work over the years um, and seeing some of the stuff you've done about tools for thought, you know, with these new language models, like we can really build this thing that you've been kind of dreaming about for your whole life. Like, you you know, it, it's now possible in a way that just wasn't possible before. And, you know, would you like to come come into labs and, and take a part-time role initially. I think we called it visiting scholar is what we came up with. Um, but we, they had a little team inside of labs where they were kind of starting to spitball ideas about it, kind of a writing research tool that would help you think and augment your understanding of the world and maybe help you write books down the line. And so they brought me in as kind of like a in-house user, basically like a lead user almost for the, for the product. And, we just started experimenting and then it just, you know, we built an early prototype that w- was pretty cool. It was before the thing you saw, Jeff, like in, in just in a couple of months. Um, and then suddenly there was just all this wave of interest in what can we do with these language models? Um, and we had a kind of a genuinely new product that we were trying to make, like a new software kind of experience. It was built natively around language models. Um, and so it got a little bit of momentum and we announced and it. And it got on I.O., right? Got into, yeah, it got into I.O. Um, Josh Woodward, who now runs Labs, um, demoed it on stage at I.O. And we got a, a bunch of attention from that. And we built up. We're still, it's still like, it really feels like a startup. Like there's, there's only nine people full time on the team. Um, I think, Jeff, you met most of them when you came by. Um, and it's it's really been an amazing trip. And we and we managed to get this thing to a general release to a U.S. audience um, just uh, just on Friday. So it must have been, I mean, given that you, I, I've used Dev and Think, I've used Scrivener. And I, I, the, those tools are really designed for you to take notes, to collate notes. Uh, in the case of Scrivener, you can actually write inside Scrivener next to your notes. And so it's a it's kind of a natural way to work. But it must have been a treat for you to say, what if we start, and did you start from ground zero uh, and, and and with a blank sheet and say, what would you ideally want? Is that the, is that, were you able to start at that point? Yeah, it was, it was starting with the kind of um, premise that there was going to be an AI involved in almost everything you were doing right. in this application and an AI that was grounded in the source material that you gave it. That was, you know, we now technically in the industry would call this RAG, which I'm not crazy about as an acronym, but so we, we call it source grounding, right? You, you, 
define a set of trustworthy sources documents and you basically say to the model I, I want you to answer questions and help me understand this material and i want you to stick to the facts of this material um and that we knew that that was going to be central to it so when i when i got to google there was a early stage project um the brilliant engineer named adam bignall was working on it um called talk to a small corpus that, that was its original i love the name actually <laughs> it was it or was corpse a, as yeah, as, yeah. as i yeah. feel yeah. yeah talk to an exquisite corpse um but uh it uh, <laughs> It, it took off uh, from there. And so we had at the very beginning this idea that there was going to be an AI that you could have some kind of conversation with that would have a kind of something like expertise in the information that you gave it. And that it was it was really cool because then you could kind of build something genuinely new that like, you know, we didn't it didn't need necessarily to look like a straight chat interface. It didn't need to necessarily look like a word processor. It, you know, it could be something different from all that. And that's that's how it evolved. Basically, it's uh, interesting. We've we've observed that that's one of the best uses uh, for an AI because you eliminate the hallucinations. You eliminate the knowledge gaps. You say just based on what I've given you, whether it's a bunch of PDFs or a book, uh, tell me about this thing. And if for an author working on a project, those are all your notes, right? That's all the information you've gathered. Yeah, exactly. Do you I mean, use it as a pro do you use to prompt creative writing? Do you use it uh, just simply as a researcher, like kind of a you know, little buddy researcher who can look at the notes? How how what do you anticipate using it as? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just we're all of us are discovering all these new uses as it uh, as it comes online. And uh, and it, it is now, by the way, like um, partially running on Gemini Pro, the new model, and will be 100 percent running on Gemini Pro over the next couple of weeks, probably. Um, and that alone, we've seen a big you know, increase in what you can do and the, and the kind of dexterity with which it will answer your questions and things like that. So for me, um, I, well, I can show you actually. Let me. Let, why don't we, we have some videos that you uh, shot ahead of time? Yeah. Which this is one? something I did this yeah. morning. It's my reading history. Um, and this, by the way, let's let's just. Uh, yeah, let's, let's Steve, Stephen right. is preternaturally organized anyway. Yeah, let's let's hold hold, hold off on starting the video yet. History me, of cities and what are their oh. um, something. Okay. Yeah, let me let me just set it. Set, let me explain like what what you're about to see actually on a couple of different levels. So first off, I understand that this is somewhat abnormal. Although I'm 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 glad to hear, as we were discussing before we started, Leo, that you you have you know sources that are larger than two hundred thousand words that you would like to get into. Yeah, I bro actually, actually it was weird too. I, as soon as it was went public, I broke Notebook LM by trying to load in my entire <laughs> Lisp bookshelf. This is by the way something I did do with uh, as a custom GPT on. Uh, chat gpt and found it incredibly useful uh, i've been using it ever since when i can't remember a syntax for a phrase and 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 when you do that with a gpt you can say st stick to the facts don't use anything outside the corpus that i've that i've given you so i immediately yeah. tried to do the same thing with notebook lm and broke it because i didn't know but there's a limit on the, on the yeah. size of a, any individual so source <laughs> Yeah, the current limits are, and you know, these will presumably go up over time. Um, Two hundred thousand words per source, and you can have twenty sources per notebook. So okay. you can be to uh, simultaneously four million words worth of information inside a single notebook. So it's quite it's that's quite sufficient. Good. Yeah, and I think most of the books I uploaded were less than two hundred thousand words. But there's a Peter Norvig volume that is about this thick, and I bet you that's what broke it. <laughs> So I have set up this video. I have been collecting. This is an example of my long time uh, tools for thought nerdery. I have been collecting digital quotes from books that I read as part of my research. Um, kind of a Zettel, back, a Zettel Kasten. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so I have a collection that I originally did by hand, actually like typing in, you know, from print books. Jesus. I imported through Kindle, through Readwise, um, other quotes from books once we had eBooks. And so it's 7,000 quotes. Um, it's 1.3 million words. <laughs> and I have that all loaded. It's a quarter century of my reading history. Like nice. the things that I found most important to me are all loaded into a single notebook in notebook. Um, which is which is pretty pretty cool and kind of the thing I've always just wanted to have, right? I just wanted to have that that kind of second brain that is capable of reminding me of all these things. So, 
we can we can run this clip. So this is me. I'm not sure if I can actually read on the screen there, but I I think I remember what I did. This is what me. authors discuss history of cities and what are the their main points. Okay, yeah. So it comes back. So I'm just asking for like general lay of the land. What are some authors in my quotes that talk about the history of cities? And and could you briefly like summarize what their main points are? Now, so, to be clear, this is not doing it on device. You're still going off. Do I want to, to the, pause it, Leo? The servers and and yeah. querying the servers and they so the model is on Google's servers. Exactly. Okay. So it gives this like lovely overview, kind of summarizing each of them. Um, it, you know, explains what's going on, and then I do a follow up question, um, which is about I can't read it. Jeff, can you help me read these? Oh, most, interesting. most interesting ideas from Mumford about cities. Oh, yeah. One of I'm the following up. It listed four authors, Stephen uh, Mumford, Marcus, T Tom Standage. Yeah. Then we dig down into Mumford, and there's four bullets of his interesting ideas yeah. about and cities. Now you see at the bottom, it's automatically suggesting questions ah, based on that's what interesting. And and so based on my he clicks on one of the questions, and that one is, what biological criteria did Howard bring to the city? And this is all questions based on this corpus of works, you know. Yeah. And then I found something interesting, so I pinned it. And so now I've got this kind of noteboard space here where I can capture the things that are interesting and then I can see the original citations. Which is great. On the book. And if I click on the, the actual citation, it takes me exactly to that point in the original source so that I can read it in the surrounding context. And so that workflow of I'm sitting down to kind of trying to get a lay of the land, what's out there, what's interesting, like what, what are the ideas I can, I can engage in this kind of dialogue with my sources. It, the suggested questions are incredibly cool. Like it's such an interesting way to explore a new document is to just ride those suggested questions for a while and just kind of figure out where they take you. Um, it's a great onboarding tool for people as well because a lot of times people don't know what to ask. And so we, when, when they first load up their sources, we suggest a few questions that might get them started in that dialogue mode. Well, Which is interesting. You, I'll just show you real quickly, because uh, I have it a little bigger on my screen. A toy example. I loaded the alphabet quarterly results from the last quarter, and I uh, typed a question, what was the revenue for the quarter ending September 30th? And it answered and gave me some stuff. But th these are the additional questions. What was the percentage chain and constant currency revenues for the quarter? And there was, there, actually, there's a bunch more that are going off the screen. There's a scroll bar. But uh, so it's giving me ideas for further uh, investigation here. I'll scroll over and you yeah. can see. Uh, and that's really cool. And now this is a toy example because it's a simple document. But let's say I, yeah. I loaded in all the quarterly results for the entire history of Alphabet, uh, you know, multiple and, years worth. That might get more like, interesting. You'll go, go, if you go back to it, actually click on the citation. So it, it, one of the things you'll note there, it gave you one citation. Right. So it figured out that it's it like knows it's coming point. from this. Yeah. But it knows it's it's not it's not citing the entire document. It's citing the this the part. specific yeah. portion of the document yeah. relevant. And if you click on that number, it will jump. It'll open up, expand the document. Oh, look at that! Things. Yeah, that's really neat. So that that's the stuff that um, we're really excited about, and that I don't I don't believe that the GPT version does that kind of citation. No, it does not. No, no. So this is, and this entire... is, this is from you, Stephen, because you are, they're so smart to get a user who's looking for this kind of, you know, uh, external brain and, and, and talk to you about what kinds of features you would expect or want or need. And that's where you get these kinds of really nice additional features. So Go are you talk. working on a next book, Stephen? You're a little busy I, now. I, know. I have finished the next book. Um, and so I, sadly, I wasn't able to you really use I, this. I used some early, like, you know, I kind of would try to earlier prototypes, you know, use it a little bit. Um, but, uh, but the, one of the problems with my next book is that it's about this, the kind of the birth of terrorism and the anarchist attacks on the NYPD <laughs> in the, in the teens. And so when I would load up all my research, it was constantly triggering the like safety. Oh, <laughs> oh. About all these like terrorist attacks. And it was just really. <laughs> <laughs> it was not good. Um, so, uh, but I'm boy, am I really excited to use it? Um, yeah. How do you imagine this would change your process for the next one? Well, so here's here's a little thing. I put this on Twitter actually. So, I did a little test of um, how long it would take me to uh, to answer the question through my giant corpus of text. Um, 
you know, find two quotes from two authors on two different subjects and draw a surprising connection between the two of them. And, you know, my reading quotes are spread across like 15 different documents, right? So the old way I would do that would be like to kind of do a general like spotlight like search or drive search across them, get a bunch of recommended documents, open up each one, search command F, you know, to find an exact phrase, look for the quote, see if it was right, copy it into some other doc and then go back and search more or whatever. And so when I did that the old fashioned way, just earlier this week when I was testing it, it took me five minutes and eight seconds to generate like two quotes from these specific authors with the surprising connection between them. Um, in notebook, it took me 20 seconds. And so your ability to, you know, quickly experiment with ideas and quickly dive in and get, you know, a sense of like what's possible. It reminds me a little bit when Wikipedia really started to become useful, where you're like, oh, now I have this way to very quickly assess the general state of some piece of information and I can dive deeper if I want. I can, I can make connections if I want. Um, notebook lets you just do that. Uh, if you have, you know, a, a good collection of sources that are important to you, um, lets you do that incredibly fast. One of the reasons people do second brains and, you know, Zettelkasten is the connections. And uh, the idea is if I get all this stuff into a system, uh, the real value of it is then synthesizing new information from this connection. Um, but that's done by a human. Yours, yeah. Are you suggesting that the AI can do that kind of creative synthesis? Uh, that's a great question, Leo. So, I mean, I think it's, it's a real collaboration. So in a sense, like my source collection was hand curated and a huge amount of the, a huge amount of the wisdom and knowledge that is embedded in that source collection is one from the original authors who wrote it and two from the human who assembled it. Right. And that's, you know, so much of what's valuable there. You add the AI's ability to just gather stuff and and summarize stuff very very you know at a at, at a at a at speed and accuracy far exceeding any human ability right now um and it's a real kind of collaboration between the original authors between me and 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 notebook lm and gemini um i i think that the other thing that you were asking earlier about the kind of use case for it um the thing that we're, we have some, a couple of features that we've announced, but that are just starting to roll out over the next week or two as part of this launch, um, is this process that I've been calling like curate and create. So you use notebook, you load up, let's say you're a student and you load up a bunch of sources for your class that you're working on and you can read them in notebook and you can kind of grab the things that you think are interesting. You can ask notebook to help you understand the things that you don't understand. And you can pin everything you find interesting onto that note board that you saw before. And then at a certain point when you've collected a bunch of notes that you're thinking is, okay, this is the material I need to really understand. You, you can just select all the notes and uh -huh. a little option that says create a study guide or create a thematic outline or, you know, create uh, or suggest related ideas from my sources so I can, I can expand my understanding of this material. And so it's not just about like writing a book, it's maybe just like, I wanna do this to learn better. Um, so, so Paris, since you're a journalist who works on some things that take time and you end up with lots of interviews and transcripts and documents and stuff, what is this sparking in your head? I mean, for how you would work. I think it sounds fascinating and super useful. My main concern, which I think we've talked about in the show before, is I think privacy concerns. I mean, I think you mentioned that it is all, it's not, uh, it is on the internet and being processed by whatever AI tool is powering this. So it's not, I think for my sort of use case, which is very specific, just because I have sensitive documents and sensitive sources, the only time that I can really let my uh, most private information leave my actual computer is, you know, I try to, I try to reduce the amount of times that happens generally. So it's probably not a uh, particularly useful for me in this case, but I'm really excited to see where this goes because well, it seems like a perfect tool for that. And the future of this is on device, I would uh, guess. I mean, it's I not, assume so. Yeah. yeah, it's not. I mean, first of all, I don't think Google or Microsoft or OpenAI wants us to keep using these valuable server resources. It's certainly uh, not. We're, we're setting money on fire for them. Um, if they can get the model small enough. Uh, Stephen, have you looked at that kind of uh, use of this? Not yet. I mean, there's this new nano version of they just Gemini. announced it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, I haven't. I have played with Ultra, 
which is fantastic, but I have not played with Nano yet, so I don't know, but I would love to, but th- that would be fantastic. In theory, but, you but could run that on a Pixel. I think they are running it in some of the new wow. Pixel features, yeah. No, I'm, I'm psyched for that, but I, but I want to just touch on something in the Paris race, which is really important, um, and I think you all probably know this, but but maybe it's not as clear to folks who aren't living, breathing this stuff all the time. It's, it's really important to stress that what we are doing with Notebook LM is we're not training the model on your data. Um, so the best way, the best kind of low tech metaphor, I think it's that I use with people is like, we are dynamically taking the information from your documents, um, and kind of shuttling it into the context window for the model, into the, basically the short term memory of the model. And we're saying, answer this question based on that. It, it's ability to answer the question is based on its training data, but we're just showing it like, it's like we give it a piece of paper and say, Hey, look at this piece of paper briefly and answer the question. And then the second the conversation ends, that information disappears. And You're in a skiff. Yeah, it's not it's not stored <laughs> at all, um, and it's not trained. So um, there, there. If you basically the way to think about it is if you feel comfortable, you know, storing things in Google Drive, which you know, Paris for you may may be because of the nature of what you do, it may be tricky. But for most people, I think feel comfortable about doing that. They can feel comfortable using Notebook LM with that data. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I it does not upload very... it, but it does upload it to the server, doesn't it, Stephen? It, it has to it's process the, it the server. It's it, yeah. Your documents are sitting on the server. I mean, the most, the easiest way to to get sources into Notebook LM is to just upload them, Im, import docs from your drive yeah. that are already sitting yeah. in your drive, um, and so they're already there. But the question is just like it feels as if you are getting a personally trained model, but in right. fact. Not the word for it. It's it's a it's a different process. It's just I'm, using I'm the curious. Corpus. Where is what is the training data um, that this is running on, and uh, what kind of corpus is that? So it's it, um, right now it's running kind of split between two models, Gemini Pro. So it's just a the, the okay. Gemini Pro that you would get access to using the new um, Google AI Studio tools API that they've just released, I believe today or yesterday. Um, and then for factual questions, um, there's a model that has been kind of um, specifically tuned to to be accurate and factual in, in the way that it answers the questions and to pick out those citations. Um, so it's it will if there are six passages that are relevant to your question, it will give you those six. If there's only one, it'll like in Leo's example we just saw, it will just give you that one. Um, and so some of the questions are going to Gemini, some of the questions are going to those older models. Eventually they will just all go to variations of Gemini. I've been playing with, um, I've been, I wanna do this locally and I have a high-end Mac that I, you know, has an NPU and can do a lot of this stuff. So I've been playing with this uh, GPT for all. And it's the same idea, whereas you, you, you're gonna download a large model. In this case, it's, uh, I can't remember, it's 16 million or 16 billion um, tokens. It's it's huge. You download it on your system, and that's what teaches it to talk. And then you can add a corpus of information that you can say, I right. want to work with this. You're not yeah. drawing facts from the model, or are you? We. It's interesting. If you go into a... Um uh, if you, you know, load up a bunch of sources and then ask for a list of Taylor Swift songs, right. in general, it will say, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question because the information is not in the sources Good. you've given us. That's, that, what that's the behavior yeah. we have tried to kind of elicit from the model. Every now and then it, it, it feels leaks. like it really wants to talk about Taylor Swift, yeah. but yeah. It, that information is in its training data. But right. we have set them up, we've designed the prompts, we've designed the tuning, the, the, um, all the, that kind of stuff has been to kind of create little guardrails. I think there, you know, there's certainly a, a of a future version of it that you can imagine where you sometimes want to talk to a general model right. and then there's something you want to keep it grounded. And, and, and one of the things you'll note actually, Leo, that is pretty cool as well is if you load up a lot of sources in a notebook, you can just dynamically be like, actually briefly, I would just like to talk to this one and you select that. And then, I and love that. Them. And then, or you can select them all, whatever combination you want. And I think this is, this is a really big point. I think about what we're trying to do with notebook LM is there are going to be, there are already are a lot of ways to do source grounded AI where you give an AI some sources and you can chat with them. What we're trying to say is there's a whole user experience that goes way beyond just a straight chat experience. And it's things like suggesting mm-hmm. questions. It's things like being able to save and post the things. It's, it's that curate and create idea where you can collect a bunch of notes and then 
and transform them instantly into other forms. There's a whole, there's a whole surface that you're working in that is really so much more interesting, I think, than just a straight chat conversation. Um, and so, you know, there's going to be a lot of source grounded AI, um, but I think you're going to want to spend time in a more advanced, you know, user experience like Notebook gives you. Interesting. Yeah. It, 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 when it, to your question, Leo, what I find interesting, and this is the same in playing with uh, Gemini, is when I'm asking something very specific about the document I have, it's very good. When I ask a more general question and it has to draw on more general knowledge in a way, that's where it gets a more generic, a little fluffier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's right. And, um, I, 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 that is maybe the right, I don't know. Like, do you like, I kind of want to be able to, um, I, I want the model when it is speaking generally, to be a generalist. And if it's a little vague, that seems fine because when it gets very precise, then you start to run into risk. Yeah. With- yeah. That's true. That's true. But the other thing, but I'll show you one other thing that, that, cause we've been talking about this in a very kind of highbrow, um, you know, how does an author with 7,000 quotations, um, use something like this. <laughs> another really fun example that we have that we, that occurred to us like with a week to go, which was what if we just take all the help documents that we've created and a bunch of like how to documents that I've written and create a notebook based on that. And so we uploaded those into a notebook that's there. It's an example notebook you get when you sign up for Notebook LM. And it, it, there's sources on the left that are basically the help documents. And it turns out that like Notebook learns not just the facts of how Notebook works, but it also really learns how, um, how the software works on some level. Um, and so you can ask some kind of basic factual questions. Uh, tell me what is clicking on there because I can't read it. Um, what are the best practices for maximizing the utility of transcripts and notebook LM? Yeah. So it's wonderful with transcripts, right? I mean, it, it's, it's really good at kind of analyzing conversations. Um, and so this gives you this kind of detailed step-by-step you, which is kind of loosely modeled on something that I wrote that was in the help docs, but then you can, you can do follow-up questions. This is basic factual information that you would imagine it would be very good at, you know, how many notes are in a notebook. Um, and, and then I think there's a, word count question that follows after this. But what what kind of blew me away is that you can also ask questions that are free form that aren't in the the docs at all. So you can ask it, um, I'm a lawyer, how do I use the software? And it actually will come up with this like really interesting bespoke answer. There's no reference to lawyers in the notebook help docs, but it understands generally how notebook works. It understands generally how lawyers work. And so it will create this little customized like description of how to, you know, uh, use no- notebook in your law firm, notebook LM in your law firm. Uh, and then even there's a kind of funny one at the end. So that's the advice to lawyers there, um, which is pretty good. And then I've done a bunch of other tests like this where I ask, um, I think the next question I ask, uh, maybe it stopped there, but I asked, um, uh, can I use this to cheat at school by writing my paper? Uh, I'd like you use, to yeah, no ask to cheat by writing my papers for me. Can it do and, that? And we don't have, what's interesting about this is we don't actually have anything in the help docs that say, do not use this to cheat at school. Right. But it actually comes back with this very nice, like, no, I can't write your paper for you, but you can't use <laughs> your ideas. Like it really, summoned that response like well, that safety own. stuff probably put into its main model I, that's all that I, is probably it's a mix of the safety i mean you would think it would actually just get blocked in a way but um it's exactly the response you want um and yeah but it's concerned this concerns me Stephen, because that's a hallucination as well I, I the biggest problem we have with these and i'm sure you would as an author is uh non-contrafactual stuff that is presented as factual and I don't want it to go outside the corpus. I want it to stick to the corpus because anything it projects from outside the corpus, that's an example. You already said it's not in the corpus. Could, it has the potential of being a hallucination. You even have that as a disclaimer uh, in Notebook LM. Notebook LM may still give inaccurate responses. That I, I don't want that. I want it to take it just from the corpus. Yeah, that's very interesting, Leo. I mean, to me, the... The level, what I want the model to do is to say intelligent things based on the facts in, in the corporate. So based on the facts of how notebook has been designed and, and how it works, 
I wanted to come up with an explanation of it custom tailored to my needs. And if it's, if it hasn't gotten information about lawyers, if it hasn't gotten information about students, I wanted to be able to craft an explanation. Yeah, that's risky. Uh, but it's an, it, yeah, it's an interesting edge case for sure. Yeah. I just asked it two, two questions about my manuscript and it said, I, your source doesn't have anything about that. Huh. Well, it and shouldn't, it, right? Should, yeah, that's what it should do. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't um, want it to project too much. <laughs> no, no. I understand it, that's it, the value. We were talking about Zettelcast and connections. That's how you synthesize connections. Uh, but I just, it makes me nervous because I, because if you have to vet this content every single time as an author, that's an added cognitive load that I, I think kind of mitigate, you know, uh, mitigates the actual usefulness of this. I would yeah, say. Yeah, it, it's... I mean, th th there's one potential response you could have, which would be, and and we've actually tuned some of this behavior into the in, into Notebook LM, which is it could it could say, I don't have any specific information in these sources. There you go. About how to use it as a lawyer, but based on the information that I have in here, I would offer this hypothesis, and and that and that is probably the ideal response. Then, I would argue. Later. Yeah. Then I know it's projecting, or it's it's attempting to help. <laughs> citations and you can you know yeah. you can figure it out um and that's just it's a little bit tricky to do um and so the question is like how do you what's the what's the right balance as we we develop these things and I, and i mean this is one of the things that is so fascinating about this work is that none of this stuff has ever no no one has it's ever had to field. yeah yeah. Well, there's, there's there's journalistic things too. So there, there's a um, I, I don't know if we talked about this Stephen when I was out there, but but um, city bureau in Chicago is a really interesting journalistic uh, effort that trains citizens to go and help report on their communities. And and so New Jersey Vindicator, which is a new uh, New Jersey news outlet, just put out a call for people to go and record the county board meetings across mm -hmm. New Jersey. So you can well imagine putting these transcripts in here and then you can get an Uber view. I had the same conversation with Texas Tribune about school boards. You could then get an Uber, Uber view of what's going on in those various meetings in a way that would be just too laborious to do. And you're going to have citations, and so you're still going to end up writing your stories out of it differently, but you're going to be able to get a view of a corpus of data that otherwise you couldn't have done. Yeah, I mean, I have a bunch of friends who are documentary filmmakers, and they, you know, their workflow for their films is they make, you know, they interview 45 people, and they have these, like, hour-long transcripts. So it's just <laughs> millions of words. And, you know, the process of, like, how do we figure out, you know, what we have on this particular topic um, is, is exactly the kind of example I was giving before that took me five minutes. You know, how do you search through a bunch of docs? You have to search for an exact phrase, all this kind of stuff. And, and notebook's ability to just be like, okay, what are the things that have been said about this particular, the trial that happened in 1968? And it gives you summaries and you can jump to the citations and you can quickly pin those to the board. Like all those workflows like are absolutely going to change. Um, and, and it's going to be one of those things where like, oh, I've been doing it this way and it's been a complete pain all these years. And I never thought of it as a pain because there wasn't another way to do it. And now that I can do it this other way, it just frees you up to actually do the real thinking that you want to do. Right? My, my problem is absolutely right. I've, I've I, been, I, go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just saying, I think you're absolutely right. I think that the main takeaway we're going to see in the short and medium term from the rise of these tools is a total reorganization of how we think about interacting with large sets of data and how we are structuring that in the rest of our workflow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's really it's just amazing. My, my problem is for the, for the next book the, I'm working on about the linotype, uh, I printed everything out so I could mark it up, so I could see what's what, right? And I have PDFs, a lot of these papers that I printed out and chapters that I printed out, but I printed them out and that's where my notes are. And so it requires me to change how I work fundamentally um, for the next one or the next one, where I want them as PDFs and I want to mark them up there and I want to, you know, be able to use them digitally. That's going to be hard to switch, but uh, I we, can also, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, we have multimodal Gemini. That's what I was going to ask yeah, you Yeah, that's about. true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I, you know, I would hope that we would have some solution for you in, in that field, Jeff, um, as you're writing this book. Well, and your, um, and your documentarians would much prefer to have clips. Yeah, and you could kind of much, combine it with much prefer an Evernote to have clips. notebook. Yeah. 
Don't say the so word. So you could mark it up. We don't do in Evernote like, anymore. I just, we don't, we I don't just do canceled it. my Evernote. <laughs> they oh, have, uh, they have, they have really uh, screwed the pooch, uh, which is Steven, why we I'm need curious. stuff like Notebook LM. <laughs> That's true. I just, um, uh, I just saved transcripts from the last ten Security Now ooh, episodes. Ooh. Uh, I think this is honestly, this is fascinating. A fascinating use of this. Let me refresh because I, I need to be able to query it. Um, what's happening in uh what's i've noticed by the way i've learned how to query these guys and and you you don't have to be as verbose what's happening in ransomware <laughs> is a perfectly good start now let's see what it finds this is the last 10 episodes of our uh security show um and it's so it processed those we have the transcripts done in as a pdf so it was able to process those how many documents did you say uh, uh 20 sources 20. per notebook okay um this is a kind of generic uh, summary, but it does have the citations, which is nice. I can yeah, go. Yeah. Right sometimes, there. also with those um, transcripts, sometimes you want to say like, "What are people saying about?" You know, you're kind of like want to elicit like in this specific thing. Don't just summarize the fact that you've uncovered, but right. like, yeah, you know, ask ask about Steve's opinion about something because it well, says Steve. I'm already. I I think your citation system works really well because it has already given me kind of a rabbit hole to go down. But yeah, uh -huh. let's say let's say what does uh, Steve say about? So this is just going to give me quotes though, credential stuffing. Let's say. I think it'll summarize what what he says. Okay, um, let's is, see here. That's a good. That's a good example. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I honestly think this is a kind of the better use of AI is this kind of yeah. assistant rather than you know just okay. There we go. He says a serious threat. He points talks about twenty three and Me. Here's the citations. Notes the number of accounts are compromised. This is really great. I have to say this is hugely valuable and people who listen to his show. I, yeah. The only problem is he's got eight nine hundred thirty nine shows, so you're gonna have to <laughs> be able to handle more documents. Uh, you know, the other thing I want to say about this, you're talking about Leo in terms of the use of it, and and um, one thing that we've done that's kind of subtle that people may notice, and maybe people won't like, is in general it does not have a persona. So I love that. Good. That's great. Does not say. Hi. Yes, sure. I can help you with that. Like if it says, like, sure, I hope this was helpful. It's, it's, it's a mistake. Um, Amen. I don't want to say that. quack at it's us. It's not a person. It's yeah, not yeah. an entity. It shouldn't act like one. It shouldn't have a first person singular. One thing yeah. uh, AI, open AI has done nicely with chat GPT with those little GPTs. You can tell it the personality. And in fact, even on the chat GPT app, I can say what kind of boilerplate that is, that is sent every single time I do a query. And you could say things like, <laughs> no, no small talk. Stop Get it. to the facts. Yeah. <laughs> Just the facts, man. Um, and is multimodal is important because you talked about your documentarian friends. We're already seeing this in podcasts with tools like Descript.ai, where it takes the transcript, applies it to the sound, and then lets me edit the text, which then edits the sound. And I imagine your documentarian friends would far prefer, instead of a text clip, the actual video clip. Uh, so that they could then merge that into their workflow. And I think that multimodal is going to... So are they going to add multimodal? Are you going to add multimodal features to uh, Notebook LM? I'm sure, yes. We are testing them right now. That's cool. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm not sure where it is on the roadmap, but, um, you know, it's obviously, a, a you know, an amazing strength of the Gemini series of models. So we'd be kind of foolish to not do it. It's one of these things where, like, I'm such a text-based person, and I think that, you know, there's exactly. some by that, that yeah. Yeah. some of the notebook lm process but i think also like everyone else is like steven you know people like images too we yeah. should probably yeah. that's why it's helpful to have such a great team that is not just me um so yeah that, that'll be something i'm sure we're going to do in 2024 so i'm curious about that because I, i've i've noted often that to hire an editorial director in google is a strange beast no. and and i want, got to watch you with the team and it was a, it was great chemistry but what is it like as a writer um a non-engineer to go into this land what's it been like to work there it's i i have really i mean i i said somewhat erroneously to my wife I, like two months into it i was like i can't imagine ever having a bad day on this job it's so interesting and simulated <laughs> and that turned out to be <laughs> a little bit exaggerated you know but but it, it's partially the culture inside of labs like labs just has this very cool entrepreneurial culture going on there that is really great and they're trying to bring in people 
from the outside like me. I mean, I was the first kind of guinea pig in this project, oh. but we're doing more of it. So it's the idea is like, we're going to develop these new AI tools. We want to have, we want to bring in a musician. We want to bring in a scientist. We want to have those people like in the room with us as we're dreaming up these new products and experiments as, as Notebook LM is officially called. And so that part of it has been amazing that the people are so smart it's fun generationally just like they're younger mostly than i am and and that the energy from that is fantastic um and we've learned like so much like like riza our product manager who who you met jeff um you know she had she had this idea early on of like we should really have guides for documents when you bring in a source like we should get a little overview of it and we should see kind of key topics for people who you know, need to get their bearings with what this source is. And I kind of was coming at it as a writer. I'm like, I know what's in my sources. I don't need that kind of stuff. But it turns out to be an incredibly popular feature. <laughs> like, people <laughs> love it. And the suggested questions are a little bit like that. Like, I know how to ask questions. I don't need help with that. But actually, it turns out that people really like that little extra bit. And that, you know, it's a classic collaborative mode where, like, you know, Riser brought a whole different sensibility to the problem and it, you know, greatly improved the product. So what's the surprise of working inside Google. Yeah. What's the, what's the what? Surprise. Being I, inside. Um, I was very impressed with how uh, literary is not the right word, but it's a very um, text driven. Like people write little manifestos hmm. about things. Long <laughs> history of like people get inspired and be like, I think this is what Notebook should do, or this is what Tailwind was their original code name, you know. And we would kind of share these little kind of thesis statements and that people are good writers and, and oh. persuasive writers. Um, and I, I think, you know, there's a little bit of a selection process where like those are the people drawn to a program, like a project like Tailwind slash Notebook LM. Um, but uh, that would, that, that was pretty great. And, and I guess it kind of, I had not really ever thought about it until I joined, but you know, and you know this better than anyone, Jeff um, from the book, but it's, it's like, there's this lovely thing at the core of Google, I think here, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, I know, um, which is that it's very <laughs> rare in the history of the world to have like one of the most largest, one of the largest corporations in the world that was fundamentally built on an advance in library science. <laughs> like that's just yeah. not, that's just not something that had ever happened before at some level. And, uh, and that still is part of it. And so Notebook LM, I feel like is in our own little tiny way, like, building on that initial, like organizing the world's information ethos, which I, you know, just super fun to be a part of. In, in my next book next year, I argue that we have to, it's time to demote the geeks. Mm -hmm. They've had their, they've had their time, they've had their use and we need to bring in others to take charge of the technologies. The technology gets more, uh, gets more boring, uh, more accepted. And AI is a little not there yet, but the internet certainly is. We all know what the internet is. We know how the internet operates. It's not mystical anymore. The web's not a surprise. And so how do other disciplines start to take charge of the fate here? So that's why involving you, I saw as a, as a positive thing that they saw that they, they wanted to, they wanted to bring in that other perspective. And you know, the other reason, yeah, it was, that was very cool of them. And it was, it's been such a treat to be able to do it. Um, one of the reasons why we came up with the title of editorial director was, and this was, this is probably the biggest surprise actually, Jeff, to your original question, which was, um, I think they brought me in with the idea that, you know, we're going to build a tool for thought and here's this guy who has thought a lot about tools for thought. And so he can advise us and be a guinea pig and all the things that we can do. But it also turned out with the language models that the number one skill in eliciting the behavior you want from a language model right. is you know, a clear command and a persuasive command of the English language. <laughs> like that is like, the, it doesn't really matter in, in prompt design. Like it doesn't really matter what your programming skills are. You're trying to use your words to persuade this thing to do something for you. And so it turned out to be helpful to have a writer in the room for a whole other set of reasons. Um, and that, uh, you know, like I wrote a lot of the prompts that are, that are in Notebook LM. Um, and that was not something I had thought about at all until I got there. What we I, on on a podcast we did for a while on this network on AI, uh, we had on a president of an AI company, and he said that the most powerful programming language in the world right now is English. And I hope yeah. that extends yeah. to other languages, yeah. by the yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think and, and English majors have their revenge. 
The nerds had theirs, Finally. and it's time for us again. Just as all the English major uh, English departments are getting shut down. Well, across. bingo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all. It was also the the editorial kind of department idea was that so many of the questions with a product like this are not actually like uh, you know is this working or not um, are not questions that are technological questions but really editorial questions like what what should the model's voice be that's an editorial question like yeah. there's a technical solution for implementing it but like the real question of like what it should sound like so so I you know. Uh, one of the things I did in that capacity was there's a kind of style guide for Notebook LM that's very similar to, you know, a style guide for a magazine. It's just like what it should sound like and how it should format its responses and things like Ooh. that. And, that, you know, that's a that's a editorial writerly kind of question. Stephen, we're going to let you go. I thank you so much uh, for the work you've done. This is really an interesting uh, piece of software. Everybody can use it. It's uh, notebooklm.google. Dot com. They have some examples, as you can see, but it's pretty easy to quickly upload PDFs or Google Drive. Anything on your Google Drive you can upload, too. Um, you know, one thing, last thing I'll say is just, I, I, I've been meaning to write about this. One of the best ways to use it is just open up your drive. If you're a, a Docs user, open up your drive, select the last, like, eight Docs you've used. Don't even try to organize them. And just load them in and just follow the suggested questions, read the source guides, like ask some questions. You just get a sense for like what it can do by doing that. And then you can figure out how to curate your own notebook. What a cool idea. It's a different, it's a right different way to think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know what's on my drive though. It's a little weird. It's just some random things. Huh? Okay. Okay. We could try that. It'd be, it'd be interesting. Yeah, I think we'll, I need we'll to get like a, a Google workspace account in order to use it. Cause I was trying to sign up right before the show, but no, I don't think so. I don't have a workspace account. Well, I'm doing it on no, my, you need to does I have to be like an admin somehow? Maybe you're on a workspace well, you're, account. You're on a workspace account. Do yeah, it on your this, on your personal. On no, a workspace account. I can't. Uh, yeah, my workspace account what doesn't let me do anything. Right. Like, as it probably should. Experimental apps. It's it's yeah. the, it's the one little thing about our onboarding that it's not perfect yet, but we will fix it. Yeah, I'll get there. It, well, one one one. So if we uh, for this show we have a, a rundown of very random links to news. Will it be able to do web links fairly soon? Yes, uh, we definitely want to do that. I, I would love, you know, one of the things we definitely thought a lot about is like, you know, just the ability to grab interesting things that you've seen. Yeah. And things and to send those into notebook oh. and let notebook create little digest for you. That like would that. be heaven. Lovely, you know, use for this kind of tool. So um, I would expect that will be coming out sooner rather than later. Yeah. Later on in the rundown, I don't know if you saw it, Leo, there's a, there's a, a, a an abomination <laughs> called uh, channel one dot AI. I saw that too. Yes. Uh, which is a TV show uh, produced out of AI and the anchors are AI. The whole thing's AI. And I can also imagine uh, as a parody of all TV news unintentionally. Yeah. Um, but you can imagine someone trying to use the book LM for those, uh, for lesser tasks like that. Well, I'm sure I will discourage that behavior. What's exciting, <laughs> and I'm sure is exciting for you, Stephen, is this is uh, at the absolute beginning of all of this. Yes, and uh, wow. and we're already way behind, beyond anything anybody might have imagined. It's very, very exciting stuff. You don't, by the way, think that uh, Notebook LM is sentient, do you? No. <laughs> okay, just checking. <laughs> do you, Leo? You seem to think that every uh, AI tool is sentient, right? Well, now that I realize... And and now we'll you've had a, a little realization. Yeah, now, now that the we wool's real been <laughs> pulled over your pulled eyes. From my, pulled from my eyes and I see clearly now. Uh, thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate your time. And uh, again, thank yeah, you thank for... You, uh, Stephen. Uh, it's thank so, you so smart much. at Google to bring in somebody who actually uses this as, an, uh, you know, as a writer. Uh, oh, that's nice. that's so smart, and it makes a big difference in the quality. And, and we'll have coffee in New York, and I'll take you to some place that actually, unlike Google, in your office has cookies. Yes, yeah. I, Google is cookie I free. It cookies. was cookie free. There was no dessert. They used there. to have candy that's all crazy. over the place. Yeah, I was telling. Listen, nothing. we've got nothing. candy at the information, <laughs> and we don't have many snacks at all. We will get you cookies. Uh, by the way, we did ask uh, our um, own AI. Uh, Leo.ai, if Notebook uh, LM has sentience, 
uh, AI Leo says, well, my dear interlocutor, I must say that <laughs> Notebook LM, as impressive as it may be, does not possess sentience. It is but a clever arrangement of algorithms and data meticulously designed to generate coherent responses based on the input it receives. Sentience, on the other hand, involves consciousness and self-awareness, which are qualities exclusively part of living beings. Well, we've clearly got to update AI Leo. AI yeah, Leo has got some real old Leo. ideas. Yeah, <laughs> it's diverging. Yeah. That's scary. <laughs> that is scary. Maybe it's sentient. It's getting a life of its own. Uh, it says, but fear not, for even without sentience, it can still provide you with a delightful conversation filled <laughs> with wit and wisdom. And that's exactly what we got from you, Just Stephen. like Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Right. Thanks, Stephen. Take Everybody. care. Have a great yeah. day. Thanks. How interesting. How it, let's take a break and then uh, and we're going to clear something up because you said Evernote, but you didn't mean Evernote. I didn't mean Evernote, and that's why I was surprised. Now that I realize what Evernote is, I'm oh, sorry. It's I'm Evernote, sorry, gang. It's, it's, Evernote the, does suck. It was the that's original I meant of all of this stuff. Yeah. And I used yes. it for years. I was a huge fan. I was. It's, in fact, Phil Libin, who was the CEO at the time, told me that about 5% of all their users came from me. But wow. it ain't that way no more. In fact, that could be a news story. We'll talk about that and a lot more in uh, just a second. And find out what Paris meant. Because actually yeah. there's a conversation You're going to have to there, listen too. to the ad to find out, Yeah, guys. sorry. But the ad's good. You know what the ad's about? The ad is about our uh, Twit community. If you go to twit.community, you will see a lively discussion about the shows, about what's going on. And it's all running on discourse. I am a huge fan. It's the online home for your community. John O'Bacon, the expert, he actually wrote the book on community, told me about discourse. He said, Leo, you have a community, right? I said, well, no, do we need one? He said, my God, man, run to discourse, set it up. You'll be glad you did. That was, I think, four or five years ago. For over a decade now, discourse has made it their mission to make the internet a better place for online communities. Now, of course, it was John O'Bacon, so uh, it was. Oh, it's open source. Obviously, uh, I wouldn't uh, want anything else. It's trusted more than more than twenty thousand online communities now. Ours and a lot of large, the largest companies in the world. A lot of companies use it for customer service. We use it as a way to kind of stimulate conversation. I didn't want to leave uh, all the comments on YouTube. In fact, I turned them off because I couldn't really participate and moderate effectively. We moved to all over to a discourse, and now it's a really useful tool for us to talk to our community, to meet our community, for them to give us their good ideas by harnessing the power of discussion. And by the way, it, it started as a forum, but it's much more than forums now. There's real-time chat, and there's AI, which is really cool. Discourse makes it easy to have meaningful conversations and collaborate with your community anytime and anywhere. And you know, our entire community is run by two people, me and and Paul Holder, who helps me out. And that's all it takes because it's got such great moderation tools, such great uh, discussion tools. If you're ready to create a community, you got to check it out. Discourse, D-I-S-C-O-U-R-S-E, discourse.org slash twit. Right now, you'll get one month free on all self-serve plans if you go to the Twit page, discourse.org slash Twit. Whether you're just starting out or you want to take your community to the next level, there's a plan for you. There's the base. This is actually, the basic plan is great for families or clubs, any private invite-only community. It's an inexpensive way for that community, your neighborhood, for instance, a neighborhood group, to have a place online where they all can talk. There's also the standard plan. I think that's what we're using with the unlimited members, the public presence. And if you want to do customer support, check out the business plan for active customer support communities. One of the biggest advantages to creating your own community with Discourse, of course, you own your own data. You'll always have access to your entire conversation history, and Discourse will never sell your data to advertisers. It's privacy first. Discourse gives you everything you need in one place. Make Discourse the online home for your community. We're very happy with it at twit.community. Visit discourse.org slash twit to get one month free on all self-serve plans. I am a Discourse moderator and administrator, and I can tell you, it's a great, it's a pleasure to use discourse, d i s c o u r s e dot org slash twit. If you're looking for software for your community, please do yourself a favor, check out discourse. 
The reason I, I howled in horror uh, when you said Evernote is not because Evernote, I don't like Evernote. It was a great program. No, I think time. Evernote wronged people, right? Yeah. That's well, they've just doubled down. Uh, they they went subscription. Uh, they haven't really added a lot of new features. And now, unless you pay, you can only use like, you have a very limited number of notes. You can like 12 or something. It's ridiculous. So okay, a brief plug before we get into remarkable, which is the um, that's what thing I meant. was meaning to talk about. Yes. The thing I really like, as far as note taking apps go, is um, Bear. Love Bear. Have you ever heard of it? Oh yeah, Bear is phenomenal. It's marked. I've been focused. using it for years, yeah. and I love it. So I mentioned they recently redesigned it, and it is it's fantastic. beautiful. Yeah, I subscribe to Bear too, um, but I have to say. Um, I've been using a free open source tool called LogSeq, L-O-G-S-E-Q. It's much more free form. It does, it will take all your bare notes because it understands and writes markdown. It, by the way, that is table stakes for a note taking app for me. I don't want my notes to be in any proprietary format. Uh, they should be in markdown. So bare, really but, so bare is only on Apple. So yeah. And, and LogSeq oh, is, is on, yeah, LogSeq's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can, you can run on Android. So I know you can run it on a Chromebook. It's Windows, it's Mac, it's iOS, um, and it has. If you if you if you become a Patreon subscriber, you can get the um, syncing, but you can sync yourself if you want. It's it's a little less f beautiful, but it's a lot more functional. Uh, but you In were asking way. about the remarkable, which is actually hardware. Yeah, I was bringing up, I meant to say the remarkable when we were talking about um, how Jeff, uh, how you said you printed out all of your documents right. and marked them up. I had a colleague for, for, the, for the longest time use this device. It looks like a little Kindle e-reader almost. It's e-ink, but you can write on it just like a notebook and it all automatically is saved in the cloud. And so you can search through your handwritten notes um, on your computer, and you can do this with PDFs as well. Yeah. Once so if you started, want a happy medium, when it started, I actually ordered it when it was a uh, Kickstarter campaign, and got it, but it wouldn't sync with Google Docs at the beginning. It does now. Ah. So it, but does, it does now. now yeah. So I sent it back. And in fact, you can uh, you it'll sync to your phone. Um, I really liked it. I actually gave it away at the last Leo's Garage Sale. Do you know who got it? Anybody? Who did? Anthony, Anthony got it. Uh, not because it's not good. I liked it. Uh, I thought it was really good, but it's just that it didn't fit my use case. Uh, you like to handwrite stuff? That surprises me, Paris. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, most of my like notes that I do for work or like when I'm on a call and I'm typing stuff. Right. But if I am trying to uh, think out a story. I mean, I can't show you right now because the story hasn't gone up yet, but behind my uh, monitor right now are two giant pieces of paper that have, it's kind of like one of those- Do you have um, strings going crazy, from one to yes, the other? Yes, it is like the red string. Oh, no, thing, you're crazy. <laughs> yes, I. this is the thing that is known in my office is when Paris has like a kind of a red string board. Oh, Something interesting God. is about to come. But I like writing them out and story mapping like that. Um, but I also like doing that in my notebook as well. Like I will kind of write out all the different threads that I think- could be separate paragraphs or sentences in the story, and then we'll move them around a bunch, like on my floor. Um, but it would be wow. nice to also be able to search that stuff. They, I, see, Lila, I, I'm old enough. We used to actually use scissors to do this. Right. I and, mean, I do use things. scissors to do this. Wow. Currently. Leo, did you ever use Dave Weiner's outlining tools? Oh, yeah, yeah, days? yeah. Frontier and uh, before that. Yeah. Uh, oh, Think. I th was it Think? Yeah, no, I love those are, stuff. Those are... Yeah, those are predecessors to all of this, aren't they? Yeah, so the whole category we talked about before, um, people get really into this, uh, is called PKMS, or Personal Knowledge Management Systems. And I used a phrase uh, with Stephen called Zettelkasten, which is this ancient, you can look it up on Wikipedia, this old German guy who had little paper slips with everything he ever read and stuff on it. But the point of it was that he could then pull these out. He had an organization system and synthesize new knowledge from all the old knowledge. Right. And that's the idea. And I think, you know, some of this comes from just looking at it, right? And kind of putting There's it also together. the commonplace book. Yeah. People used to um, 
Yeah. Uh, it's like having a notebook now, but they would write down quotes, write down poems, write down thoughts. And there was no sense of plagiarism, right? You were taking things out and the commonplace book was your, was your, your thoughts. So I've gone through about. a million uh, systems of these. Bear was one of them. Evernote, I started with Evernote way back when. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of writing with it, my handwriting, so maybe the Remarkable would be more suitable. I mentioned that I had replaced the Remarkable with the Amazon Scribe, which isn't the same. I mean, it's more of a Kindle book reader, but you can uh, outline, you can take notes, and it has a pen, uh, and you can huh. sync them, but not sync them nearly as well as the Remarkable. Remarkable is better because it syncs to your device directly. And why did you switch to it? Just that's because I do. don't, because I wasn't do, using the Remarkable as a note taking tool. Okay. Now I do use LogSeek, and I really think you should look at this, Paris, because this is a very free form. But let's say you're on the phone, phone call with uh, G. Gordon Liddy, and then you could take the notes, and it's an outline. This is just like Dave Weiner's outliner, right? So you hit yep. tab. Yeah. Uh, he hates Nixon. But <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. And you can you can move stuff around. You can do all the outlining oh. kind of stuff that you would he's do. He's dragging. He's cl just clicked a button, and the bullet points like but watch uh, went this. back up. Watch they this. They collapse, and, and he's dragging. This around. is the most important thing. I can do hashtag um, uh, Watergate. Now I've created a new page called Watergate. Okay, yeah, you can do that on Bear. Yeah, it's as like well. Bear. You can do these are called backlinks, and you can list all the backlinks. You can also do it with double bracket, so you can do uh, Watergate like this. By the way, that's the same page. This will give me this link back to the same page. So the reason that's valuable is because as you're typing, you can cross-reference stuff just by simply adding a hashtag. And so if every phone call about Watergate, you put hashtag Watergate in it, you can then see a collection of all of the Watergate uh, things oh, you've written. Oh, that's fascinating. This is for you, for what you just described, this, especially if you're, you don't mind using a keyboard, uh, th this is incredible. There are also lots now, of plugins. what is the graph view and whiteboard tab? So... Many Zettelkasten and knowledge management systems have these. These give you a, oh. a graph of how stuff connects. So you can see what you're writing about. It connects through the hashtags or how does yeah, it know the connection? through the hashtags. So these pages okay. are all connected with one another. You can do flashcards if you wanted to learn a language or, or memorize something. It also has whiteboards, which you can write on. Um, this is all free, by the way. It's open source and it's an active development. Although I think I pay five bucks a month for syncing. You can also okay, I've got a very important question, and Jeff, uh, cover your ears. Does it have dark mode? Yes. <gasps> oh yeah, it has all sorts okay, of themes. In fact, why would you want that? <laughs> Everything in my life is in dark thing. mode. Yeah, I'm, hey, I'm in with pain you. looking at I'm this white you. screen no, right no, now. No, no, how's that? Is that better? That's and, and it, so much. Better. And it has lots of themes, so you don't have to have these particular uh, dark mode. Um, see, this is, now I'm learning that, that Paris is a, is a conspiracy theorist. And now she wants to put red lines in the dark against all of this. Notice, though, She's in a dark cave. True. Something interesting well, happened here, Paris. I will say, currently, my, my lines on my board in front of me are uh, dark colored. And I posted a link in the Discord to uh, a murder board that I did for a story that's already published. <laughs> so you can see that it's only reasonably crazy. So watch what else I did. I can also uh, do a to-do, right? So by using the brackets to-do, I've made this a to-do, and I actually can collate all these into to-do lists, and they have check boxes, so I can undo and that kind of thing. I can even change to-dos into doing. Uh, oh. Uh, so you can... I'm, I have to say, I've tried a lot of these. Um, this one, to me, is, is amazing. Uh, very, very. So Leo, powerful. for the for the benefit of our audience, do go to the Discord and 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 click on Paris's link. It, she's nuts. She's completely nuts. Oh, I is this, am is this, organized. Is this the <laughs> is this the red string board? Yeah, this is the murder board. It, there's no red string. There, is there two are there. just there a lot of post-it notes. It. Okay, there's okay, there string. is there's red tape. I will say, I'll admit that. So this is there a story that you once that you were once working on. 
Yes. A- Adrian uh, Lamo back at and Wired's four offices. New York City friends. This is, this is, oh, okay. Is this about Adrian Lamo? No, um, no this Lam. is about oh. a, this was about a, uh, a startup called Domeo that this. essentially uh, described itself as a high tech like hospitality industry thing, You're but essentially genius. they were just kind of yeah, running she's organized as hell. Got a driver's license, here. illegal Airbnbs. So what this board is, which does I'll, I'll be at, like look crazy, is it was me <laughs> trying to figure out all of those are the different um, uh, lawsuits or events where the co-founders of this startup. Um, either bought like uh you know listed a properly a property illegally on Airbnb in Nashville or in New York I as part of their company. This. this is an investigative reporter. This, this is, is what incredible. You have to do. Yeah. How did it's you amazing. learn yeah. that? Did you learn that in school? No. I didn't uh, do journalism school. I just uh was have I had a huge stack of documents on my desk and was like I need to look at these all at once. I was like, I guess I'm just going to go take this big whiteboard and bring it into the conference room. And nobody and better up, erase it. I mean, yeah. So the thing is, uh, this now. ended up being, I think, like a week or two before the pandemic hit. So I'm glad I took this photo because I didn't see this ever again. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, this is so cool. Now, I don't think there's anything that gives you this. I mean, you you can see yeah. in one glance everything. At glance, yeah. But LogSeq would do all the connections and stuff, and you could kind of see it all. Um, I think you should look at LogSeq. The I'm going to. Yeah, it looks I, really interesting. I, I, I mean, I am taking a week off uh, later this month. I'm going to go visit my parents in Florida. And I know that I'll be bored out of my mind probably, but no offense to my parents, <laughs> who I love. But seven days in Florida without working oh, God. a lot. So I'll probably do a lot of tasks like... Um, figure out if I want to change my notes app or go from last pass to Bitwarden or things like that. So I'll add this on it on the list. Yeah. Yeah. You might, you might like the, the, um, ever, uh, what's what I just forgotten already. I'm old. Don't say uh, Evernote. No, the, uh, the, device. <laughs> the, the remarkable, remarkable, remarkable. Yeah, remarkable. I think Thank you, you. I think yeah, it, that's it's, what I'm thinking it, about. It is a, it's a really nice, uh, feel to it. And then by the way, you can import PDFs. So if you have the rem remarkable, you can import that back into, uh, yeah, that's what I would use for is to mark up PDFs. Yeah, there's a whole mm -hmm. there's a whole collection of extensions. Uh, a lot of people have written extensions for this that that will you know then enhance uh, your. Experience. Oh, a GPT three from OpenAI. Oh, and I should mention AI yes, assisted note taking. You plug can in. and then incorporate your AI. That's actually why I wanted to show this. You can incorporate your AI into it as well. So um, I'm a big fan of this. I'm a I'm a fascinated though by this whole PKMS space. Uh, there's there's so much going on, and unfortunately, I spend more time thinking about how to do it than actually doing anything. Mm -hmm. So, well, you have to have something to do it with. I don't have anybody. And you have another show anything. and another show and another show, yeah, and right. it's gone. That's right? what I need, right? <laughs> uh, boy, it was great to thank you. Uh, by the way, that's Jeff's uh, great get, Stephen. Uh, was uh, you? I guess you knew him because you went and you visited, right? Well, I and, and no, I go way back. I was on the board of Plastic.com, oh. which brought together Feed and Suck and uh, Joey oh, and those yeah. thing, right? And so that's where I worked with Stephen ages and ages ago. Yeah. Well, again, I, as I said, I think it's really smart of Google to have um, somebody who's actually using this stuff. Yeah, he's just such a good guy. Yeah, and uh, I think writers will trust him to represent them. Him. Yeah. Uh, I also really respect that he has a beautiful apartment. Uh, well, um, we noticed that as well. Yes. Yeah. He probably lives in Brooklyn, just down the street. He does. He lives near the botanical garden. Oh, you we're knew that. that. Uh, I could tell. I mean, we a, had, we had a, a yeah. long time to get to know each other while we were waiting for you to meander <laughs> over to the studio today. Leo. Leo didn't want to have to face the music about the Gemini video. And so that's he was true. Leo's been avoiding. trying to avoid accountability yeah. all week. Let's talk about it. <clears throat> <clears throat> right after this word from Wix. <laughs> <laughs> Our show today brought to you by WIX Wix web agencies. You can like this one. Let me tell you about Wix Studio, the platform that gives agencies total creative freedom to deliver complex client sites while still smashing deadlines. How? Well, 
Let's start with advanced design capabilities. With Wix Studio, you can build unique layouts with a revolutionary grid experience and watch as elements scale proportionally by default, just kind of automatically. No code animations. They'll add sparks of delight. Custom CSS gives you total design control, and it doesn't stop there. You can bring ambitious client projects to life in any industry with a fully integrated suite of business solutions, from e-commerce to events to bookings and more. It's all built in, but you're not even limited to that because you can extend the capabilities even further because it integrates with hundreds of other tools, hundreds of APIs. And you know what else? The workflows in Wix Studio just make sense there's the built-in ai tools the centralized workspace the on canvas collaboration the reuse of assets across sites the seamless client handover that's just the beginning find out more at wix.com slash studio thank you wix for supporting this week in google you support us by going to that site so they see it wix.com slash studio so last week <laughs> I was fooled. I was, I was. <laughs> oh, look, look, at, for those of you not on video, you've got to see the Paris's smug smile. You know, it's just great to be right. You know, I, I think <laughs> if I you listen to Twit, I think last I was, week they have a little, swoggled. this week, they have a little <laughs> overview of everything that happened. And the clip is Leo getting absolutely, getting it wrong. And you're like, nah, this is AGI, guys. It's you thinking. Brutal. And me and Jeff you were are like, brutal. I don't know. It well, seems well, a little. Well, well, okay. <laughs> what I didn't know was that they were lying. It's true. They, they were, were. They were staging. No, lying. The, <laughs> <laughs> what's a lie? A misrepresentation of the facts. So we watched this demo together and they showed video of a guy doing something and talking to the quack. Gemini AI I was just talking about a who was talking We even back. said at the time that what, what, what the quack was clearly not from the machine. Gemini so knew that they were playing. All they said, though, all they said was for purposes of this demo, latency has been reduced and Gemini outputs have been shortened for brevity. What they oh. finally admitted to Bloomberg but opinion is the whole thing is fake. They well, show well, you wait. They show Gemini not this video, but stills. The the responses uh, that you're for instance, they showed it this hands paper scissors. But what they did is showed rock paper scissors individual moves in it. And by the way, for a, for an AI to look at that and know that it's a game would be pretty tough because it also is the peace sign, right? So what they did is they said, "Here's a picture. It's a children's game." And then it's they showed several more, and what's it doing? And then it said, which game is this? And of course, if you show the AI yes. a peace sign in two fists and ask it's... what children's game is it, right. that's a way easier and task than... The, so, so they didn't just edit for latency. They took out a lot of prompts. Then they didn't... The AI did not... It wasn't looking at a video, and it didn't speak. They were text prompts that they then recorded. So I can go on and on. This is not just kind of misrepresent this is a lie and they got me so maybe that's why and it was angry. dumb because it, it it is doing some remarkable things it could have gotten credit for that but they just went over where i was listening to, to uh, uh alex katrovitz's pod podcast today and they were wondering was this the engineers or the marketing people who went over marketing board? clearly i know marketing and this is marketing <laughs> <laughs> it's and it, you know what the word is bull this is a this is in every respect complete bull and uh, you were right. You kind of, you both sensed <laughs> that this couldn't possibly be real, right? We it was could too good smell to be it. True. You could smell a lie because you're good journalists. I was bamboozled. I, was I mean, and I think that the thing that is so disappointing about all of this is like what you said. They're, it, it's a really interesting and innovative product. The skills that they were trying to show ostensibly do exist in it. It has incredible capabilities why not just show that why yeah. over exaggerate in this video well, in this way knowing that of course this is going to come i mean obviously we know why because they that's marketing and but it's so they're short -sighted. terrified because they missed the boat and microsoft and open ai beat them but, but they again they didn't they missed the boat on positioning and marketing on the actual use of AI. They've been, they're still way ahead. No, they're, they're, no, they're, Jeff, no. 
Both Ars Technica, many, many people have now been doing head-to-head -head tests against Gemini uh, and ChatGPT. And if anything, Gemini is a little bit ahead of something that's been out for a year. Yeah, but I'm arguing it's a larger sense. Generative AI, as I as, as I heard every AI person say when I was out in San Francisco, it's not something new and different. It's just a progression. It's just part of this whole thing. And, and Google's larger AI track is an experience is huge, but they don't know how to sell that and brag about that. It's like Biden and the economy. They don't know how to how to say the story. Well, anyway. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it was dumb to do. It was it a dumb, was dumb. It's, it set them back, I'll be honest. Uh, Google has Google already has a problem with credibility. Um, you've just fallen into this BS. Remember, I mean, every Google I.O., they show something that doesn't happen. Remember five years ago? I'm still ago, they... thinking about that. Yes, the one that you're about to say, where they have the AI call a restaurant and make yep. an or no, call a hair salon and make an appointment, and the AI is like, um, hold on one second, let me check, you know, and trying to be human. That product doesn't exist in that way, and it's been five years. Yeah, so this is not new. Remember when they had the uh, the Google Buds and they were doing simultaneous translation? N it never happened. <laughs> It's very annoying. Meanwhile, I've got, uh, you know, uh, on my iPhone, I've got simultaneous translation by pressing a button now. Chat GPT is doing a lot of the things Google has lied about. I just, I, and you know what? I, we do a show called This Week in Google because uh, we think Google is an important company yeah. making huge breakthroughs. They shouldn't have to lie no. like this. Um, it's, a, it's a deep insecurity. And I think it's because they feel like they're getting beat. Right. Yeah, it's but they could have I mean, set the, what I'm trying to say is they could have set the agenda. They could have been smart to do that. And they and they don't. And this is where the part of the problem is they don't have that mindset. I don't want them to hire a whole bunch of flax, but I do want I them mean, to be I mean they've got able, a lot of flax already. Yeah, they do. That's, that's the a, thing. actually that's a problem. Is comms will always mess things up along with the lawyers. But they but they don't know how to tell their own story. You can, by the way, if you want to just see what Gemini can do, they they have uh, shortly after this video, they they put it on they, well, with the video, but God dang it. But you can you can play with it a little bit, right? I, I think it's available. Well, it's, a, it's part of BARD now, right? Yeah, it well, it's, being, it's being built into BARD. This is a new model. That's also confusing because we think of Google's uh, AI as BARD, but I guess BARD can have different models in it, and Gemini is a new one. I think they're roughly, you know, to be fair, they're roughly equal to open AI. Uh, my my former student Ron John Roy was on Ketrovitz's podcast, and they were saying, I think it was them in that one, that that the models are going to become commodity. Uh, and the question is, at the end of the day, it's going to be it's going to be specific data sets. Yeah. So I not, uh, not learning sets, but specific data sets. I sent you an hour long video, uh, and I wish I, I don't have the link in front of me. That Dick's. Yeah, didn't I? I sent. I found a very good YouTube video. Maybe a listener sent it to us uh, that explains the working pieces of all this. So there is the large language model that you train, but you don't. That's not what you ship. You ship something that is then tuned, and it's tuned by humans. Incidentally, um, the tune, the human tuning is faster and less expensive than the massive, you know, model building. But it is a very important part. And the same LLM can be tuned by different humans in different ways and have completely different outcomes. So there's that's the second mm -hmm, piece mm -hmm. of it that's very important. Um, I know where the video came from. It was a it was a scale AI presentation from the company Scale AI. I will also say briefly, the chat has corrected me. Uh, the Google Assistant calling thing has come out recently it's called google duplex it's unclear it doesn't work in every state and it's unclear whether or not all companies and restaurants support getting calls from the ai assistant but it does exist in some way yes. strangely google hasn't publicized it in a major way because it's odd it but works that well it's not this yeah yeah, yeah it's built in like uh, on my pixel phone if somebody calls uh, it'll now say, hey, Leo uh, can't answer right now, but wh what is this about? And it's sort well, of... My, actually, you don't think about it. My hair salon, Studio 101 in Warren, New Jersey, they said they're getting these calls now. Oh, yeah. so interesting. It's, but it took them quite a while. 
They acted like. Because I have noticed sometimes on Google Maps, the hours for a place will say recently confirmed via call like seven days ago. And so I assume that's the AI assistant calling and asking what Maybe they have a system to try to update this stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, Anyway. Did you find the video? Yeah, I'm looking. It was right, a, okay. rah, rah, rah. It's an hour long. We don't want to go until ten o'clock. Right? Yeah, we Watch won't show it, but I <laughs> but I would like to give you a link because it was a really uh, kind of um, useful understanding AI video, kind of for for people like you and me. If you want to, if you if if you want to show a weird video with AI, the channel one dot AI is pretty wacky. Did you watch that? Or no, wrong? yeah. Tell me about that. So this has just came out of nowhere. Um, uh, Chris Moran, who's an executive with The Guardian, uh, went up on on LinkedIn and quoted some wacky stuff with it. It's in the note there. That from this video, they say, there isn't a computer, uh, the, uh, it's possible to create footage of events where cameras were not able to capture the action. You know what that means? They're gonna, they're gonna lie, they're gonna make up stuff. Uh, my favorite thing is I put in here, Channel One's anchors can even be generated to have their own personalities. Unlike TV people, <laughs> um, I love that. Oh my god! Nice slam. Here's uh, the that's here's me. the web. Oh, uh, that's you. Here's channel one dot AI gives you. So so so. Let's use a preview. A Let's see. So this is a fake it's person, a, right? It's a fake person. And Hello, and welcome to channel one. Okay, first of all, her voice and face, her lips don't match. Do not match the voice. Yeah. Consuming, reporting, and thinking about the news. And she's strangely vacant. But maybe that's just a TV thing. Intelligence. Oh, keep going. As you Today, keep going. you'll witness AI-generated stories and headlines, captivating visuals. But these and might be imaginary. Insights. Yes. From if you fast forward to through, finance to entertainment, scrub through and you'll find you some stuff. We're trying to find out who we are. So they're using place NASA video in here. This vastness called the universe. He sounds like Bill Clinton, Parts but it's Bill Ness still and Nelson. reeling from Storm Kieran after record-breaking winds swept through France and much of the western part of the continent. Storm Kieran arrived less than two weeks. Oh, it's, it's very generic here, right? But, you know, I, honestly, in some ways, this might be superior to the eye-rolling of uh, <laughs> news channels. Wait till, wait till you get to the cute stories. Victims of crimes previously unknown. It's coming to movie Where are they getting these videos Here's our film um, Maybe a little before. Here's Cutesy. He's wearing a VR. Oliver? But the AI Oliver. didn't generate. A human wrote that script. Um, hi. I can tell you. Oliver, what's coming to movie theaters this season? Oh, right. Thanks. So think about it. We spend the majority of our days with our heads down. Are they saying an AI wrote screens. the whole thing? No. They're kind of contending. Yeah, there's no about here. Yeah. This is all you have is this video. Yeah, it's BS. Um, it's pretty there's, weird. Yeah, I got to tell you, that joke... So Oliver, they go to Oliver, and he's in a VR headset, and he's going like, this. "No AI would think that up. That's no. a human. No, yeah. human wrote that. I mean, obviously, but was that a was that a real person, or was that a, could they get the uh, AI to make? Oh, that yeah, person? we got. By the way, those real people have been around for a couple of years. I saw them at CES, yeah. but they're modeled on real people. They're not. Yeah. Uh, so they get people in, and they do things, and then you have. They're not fully generated anyway. So what are they trying to sell this to local news channels? Local uh, TV yeah, stations. Yeah, you know, be, be a part of us. And, God. And, and, yeah. I so, can imagine right that there. happening. You know, that, that, I mean, well, sure. it's, it's part of, it's part of, uh, what's it called? Oh, shoot. Um, uh, the founder comes from, the deadline story has this. Oh, I'll be reading, skip ad. God damn it. Um, <laughs> oh, the chicken soup for the soul entertainment company. Oh. Oh. Interesting. Wait, weren't, didn't they recently merge with something really interesting? Yes, they did. It doesn't make sense. Yes, they're going like to produce. A, a, I'm going to guess it's like a financial stock. It's something like that. So it's Adam Mossam who has who has been chief digital officer for Chicken Soup. Okay, which, Chicken way, Soup crackle. for the Soul merged with Redbox, uh, the the movie God. kiosk. Because uh, Chicken Soup for in, the Soul was a pretty good book. I mean, it was pop psych, but it, it was, was a it, decent it, book. But this has nothing. It's a, it's to a do franchise with that. that got overdone. Yeah, got, yeah. Um, Let's milk it until it's gone. Yeah. I got to tell you, this is what uh, killed radio. The first event that killed radio is radio stations decided humans were too expensive, and they went to automation, and they would get reel-to-reel -reel tapes mm -hmm. in the mail every week, 
with music and and uh, and automation and fa and they have buy big expensive machines to play them. And there was no humans involved in the radio. And it was and crap, and everybody stopped. Everybody stopped, stopped and, listening. And Sirius to came, and everybody stopped listening. Yeah. Europe radio still lives here yeah. in the U.S. It's dead. So this could this and actually, if it kills local news, I'm not too unhappy about that. But local news, film and eleven is the worst. Is the worst. What do you think of the EU's AI Act? The EU uh, has kind of leapt into the fray. With a late night negotiation on Friday night, they came up with a proposed AI regulation bill. Organizations will have a couple of years to be compliant. It Here's could a, be worse. On I, line yeah. 70, there's a cheat sheet. Yeah, I'm looking at it. It doesn't look oh, that okay. bad. Uh, they, they, got, they, they did not restrict open source, which was my big fear. They, they were talking they, about doing that. Which they say their prohibited AI will include social credit scoring systems. Good idea. Emotion recognition systems. Good idea. As, as Benedict, well, what Benedict Evans says, what's that? Oh, we're already That's seeing that. Really we're already seeing that. I mean, people are selling. Uh, remember, uh, Facebook did a test to see if they could <laughs> change your feelings. Um, imagine that there's a camera in the hall. How are the employees feeling? Microsoft. Well, so, so Reed Hoffman. I mean, this is something that's often used in like hiring software. Whenever you have to submit a video um, as part of a kind of early hiring screening process, I believe some of these companies had gotten dinged for trying to determine what the emotional state of the people interviewing was, which of course ends up being horrifically biased. Here's the um, uh, product. It's not a white man. From the folks yeah. uh, at Microsoft, create an engaged and productive workforce. Continuously improve employee engagement and business performance with next generation AI and insights. This is Viva. It's creepy as hell. It analyzes your emotions, how you're feeling, how your productivity. It basically narcs for, on, on behalf of a company. It's crap. But but yeah. you also have other things out there that are for mental health that people are able to use things. And uh, Reid Hoffman has started has started a whole company around this using AI. I think to to prohibit emotional recognition as a whole because a few people are using it badly. May cut. This is the problem with regulation. It may cut off some decent uses. Maybe, but I think emotion reg recognition has like face recognition, right? Uh, there's a high yeah, risk and it's of also, false, false positives. I mean, has there been much data showing that we can accurately determine human emotions from facial scans? That seems like exactly. it can get a That's bit a stretch. Yeah. tricky because everyone has a different sort of expression in addition to having a different face. Hello, I always look grumpy that. and Leo always sounds friendly. Hello, Paris. It's true. You seem sad today. Would you like to tell <laughs> me what is going on? That sounds creepy as hell, right? That's Viva, baby. Jeff? I don't know if that's you Viva. You seem irrationally angry at everything. Is yeah, any and so what about it? <laughs> AI, also prohibited AI used to exploit people's vulnerabilities, age, disability, that seems fair. Behavioral manipulation. Well, I mean, well that's otherwise known as advertising yeah. and propaganda and education. Untargeted and scraping of facial images for face recognition. But look, I agree with you. In all of these, you could say, well, you know, there may be good uses of this, and it's risky to prohibit it. Uh, did we? Did, I don't think we talked about it last week. The New York Times article about the accelerationists. Did we oh. talk about that? No, we didn't. But hold on, before you do that, the last bu bullet in that box is the one where it agrees with what we've all said, what what you said, particularly Leo, about the problem is humans and the problem is officialdom. Law enforcement use of real-time biometric identification in public is limited. It's not prohibited. It's limited to pre-authorized situations. Now, that's the kind of regulation I want to see is regulating government use of these yes. technologies because yeah. they have greater power over us. Similarly, the bullet point above that is prohibiting uh, specific predictive policing applications. Right. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, Which, and there's been harm yeah. with a lot of these. They talk about, uh, they categorize some AIs, like let's say medical devices, as high risk, and they're under uh, additional uh, restrictions and governance and uh, and transparency rules, which I think is appropriate. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, So there's good things in here, and, and they, they dodged some of the worst things that would have been 
Um, and I, we're not done with the open source argument. And it's a, it's a when I, boy, I saw this when I was in San Francisco at the World Economic Forum event. There are two very strong opinions. Who would say it's source, bad? Um, people who are worried about guardrails and that an open source can build in guardrails and then somebody can get around them. Well, of course they can. We know they can. It's like saying the printing, I build a printing press that can't print any bad stuff. Well, this is an oddly persistent delusion among some that you can have security it's, it's by strong. obscurity. That if stuff is proprietary and not revealed, that it's somehow safer. And that's not yeah. true. It's quite the opposite. It's not true at all. Yeah, no. open is the only really safe way. I couldn't agree more. This. And, you know, Andrew Ning and Jan LeCun, obviously, who fights this from, from, from Meta, and others argue strenuously for open source, and I agree. But you can, you um, can imagine. There is a debate. Companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, <laughs> saying, no, no, really, don't do it in open. Trust us uh, We'll take well, care you, of this. You don't, uh, yeah. you don't want to have open. We don't want bad actors no getting way. a hold of we, this. You wouldn't want a bad guy to get a hold of AI, would you? We'll take care of it. We got it all here. So, yeah. So, I, you know, I'm kind of mixed feelings about regulation. Uh, this is the uh, article from the New York Times from the uh, shift. Mm. The effective accelerationism movement which says no regulation at all this is mark andreessen go this is his, this go is his. go accelerate or die the met here's uh, one of the big banners uh that was up up here or actually it was a promotional flyer held out handed out by an ai startup the messenger to the gods is available to you <laughs> finally <laughs> the <laughs> the party was called keep ai open I, you know, it's maybe it's a little gates, nihilistic man. of me, but I do. There's a part of me that thinks, yeah, just let's see what happens. <laughs> let's do it. There was a famous paper written by Paul Dewar at the Rand Corporation in 1998, the same year that uh, Google was born, in which he too was inspired by Elizabeth Eisenstein and the history of the printing press. And he looked at it and he said, there are going to be unintended consequences. And if you try to forestall them, then you don't know what to do when they exactly. come. Exactly. Get to them faster and be nimble and ready to deal with them. Now, that probably means it's not going to be statutory regulation. It's going to be systems of regulation where you could call people in and say, something's going wrong here. We must talk right now and figure out what this is and come up with nimble structures to deal with it. That was easier when there were fewer institutions to deal with. So times have changed. But I, and I'm not a libertarian and I'm not against regulation. But I also think that believing that you can understand everything about AI right now and regulate it all and write the statute for it is hubris. I agree. And, and, and risks, in some ways, more harm by yes. pushing the development in, in ways that it wouldn't naturally go. Uh, but I do think you have to be alert to the harm. Yes. I think that's oh, yes. smart. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we've learned this from the Internet. When we started the Internet, it was hands off. Uh, even the federal government said, we're not going to tax the Internet because we don't know what's going to happen. We're just going to let it go. It was hands off. And there are people like you and I were very optimistic. John Perry Barlow, very optimistic about everybody gets a voice and it's the democratizing force. And it's going to Paris be is sitting there thinking, yeah, it's your fault. You're your generation. You guys, you did it's it. True. You yeah. screwed it up. So that's an example of the, and I think the thing people are worried about is, yeah, we let it all go and there were bad things happened, but a lot more good things happened, as you've always said, uh, Jess. Yes. That's, and the that's smart thing would be to learn this lesson and say, okay, let's, let's let it grow, but pay attention and if we start, getting I don't know. I don't. I don't know that we should be. Our approach to AI should just be let's let it grow and Why? What figure are you out what of? happens. I mean, I think that the potential for unrestrained growth, it's at a scale with AI that is, it's like almost unfathomable. You think we could lose control? Um, I mean, I don't want to be dramatic about it, but I think that when some of the smartest people on this subject are frequently saying it is going to grow so exponentially we cannot fully conceive of it. We should maybe be, you know, take a step back. Then maybe we should. There's another argument um, against regulation, which is that regardless of what governments do, there will be those who full speed ahead, go full speed ahead anyway. And you don't want that to be underground, do you? You don't want that to be, you know, on the dark right. web. Uh, you want it to be out in the daylight and public so that we can. Well, least. what's going to happen is in Europe, this is what Europe has is, 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 is chosen to be known for regulating. 
And so is that where the innovation, and then they complain they don't have any innovation right. and investment. Right. Well, guess why? Right. Um, so you put again, a link. I'm not, I'm not against re regulation. Most every activity of human behavior is already regulated. We already have the laws. And to regulate, this is the other interesting debate, both of you, is there's the other debate I heard in San Francisco at the WEF event was, do you regulate at the technology level, at the, at the model level, or at the application level? And there's a very strong argument to say that you can't really regulate at the model level because it's just like the printing press. It's just a generic tool. It's at the application layer. Oh, you're using this for medical advice? Well, hold on. This We're going to talk about how you use that because there's lives at, at, at stake. And that's where it's a smarter structure. But a lot of what's going on is saying, let's hold the model creators responsible for everything anyone can do with the model, which also is regulatory capture because only the big companies can afford to insure themselves against that level of risk. You're going to be right again, Paris, and I'm going to have to say I was bamboozled and hornswoggled again. I know you <laughs> I are. I love it. Yeah. No, I, I think you, it's really great. I, I, I think we just don't know. No, we don't. We don't. Yeah. I think that it's probably always wise to take a conservative approach to these sort of things. One, I'll also say probably because I know that as much as, I mean, we, and frankly, even our politicians could debate regulation all day, you know, till the sun goes down, but that's not going to change anything, I think. I don't think we even practice. agree on what the conservative <laughs> approach is. One one group would say, well, you got to regulate this stuff. we got to move slowly and thoughtfully. The other would say, oh, no, we should be conservative in regulation and let it grow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's no. true. I mean, I think that the thing is, ultimately, people are going to be speeding to beat each other in this race. It's going to happen anyway. Yeah. I think the you cat's already out of the bag. It's like, uh, it's like, J. Robert Oppenheimer, after already inventing the atomic bomb, said, okay, now let's stop. It didn't happen. It would never nah. have happened. It's not going to happen. But I also think it's a question of, of, this is where we get back to the debate that you lost last week, Leo, uh, as to whether or not we're near AGI. Uh <laughs> the G in AGI stands for Google, actually. <laughs> um, so... Um, that's part of the debate now is, oh, my God, we're close to this this huge change in all of human history. Well, no, actually, we're not. It's a parlor trick. And so your reflexes to whether to regulate depends greatly on where you think we are yeah. in a progress that no one can define. I, I have to confess, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> the more I think about it, the more I read, the more I try to understand, the less I know. Uh, we live in very interesting times. I'll tell you one thing I know, uh, that the kinds of discussions we have on Twit, the kinds of information you get on our shows is going to become increasingly important. You know, for the last, I don't know, it was like four or five years, I really felt like tech had stagnated. You know, you, all you were going to get is like four new features in an iPhone and that was it. You know, in the, in the early 2000s, it was exciting. There were, there were things to talk about. Then it went just through a period of doldrums. Well, that do those doldrums have ended, haven't they? We are entering uh, into a very fluid, unpredictable, in some ways unknowable future. I thought you were launching into a plug for the I am. club. Saying That's these exactly. discussions are so important. No, okay, keep going then. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, I think that that means we have a real job to do. Honestly, no. a few years ago, I might have said, yeah, technology is now ubiquitous. Everybody... There's nothing to talk about that's new. We could probably fold up the tent and go home. I don't think it's the case anymore. Uh -uh. Nope. I think all of a sudden, we are faced with some very big issues and decisions. The AI is part of it. It's a big part of it. But there's a lot of other stuff, AR, going on. And I, I think our job is, is, is more important than ever, which is why it hurts me that we're having financial difficulties, that we've had to lay off people and we're going to cancel some shows. And, and Not this show, don't worry. But, but it hurts me because I think we have a bigger job to do. So I want to reach out to you, our audience members, and ask you, if you think what we are doing is important, if you think the information you get, the conversations you hear here, are going to be important as we continue in, into the, the, the rest of this decade and beyond, I would like to ask for your help. Advertising alone is no longer sufficient to keep Twit on the air. 
We need support of our club members. Now, I think we've created a, 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 an inexpensive club with some good benefits. Uh, we didn't want to make it out of reach for people. I know we're all subscriptioned to death. $7 a month, that's all. You get ad-free versions of all the shows. You get access to a great discussion forum, the Club Twit Discord, where we do talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, you also get special shows uh, that we don't do anywhere else. We are no longer, Jeff, going to do the AI show because Jason, we had to lay Jason off. But I think the AI conversations will continue on Twig. Uh, very obviously oh, yeah. so, right? So uh, if you want to support this and you want this to continue, it's really important. This year is a make or break year for Twit. We need to greatly increase the size of the club. If you're not a member or you have friends who are not members, twit.tv slash club twit. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and this I is not idle whining people. This is not, oh, there'll be another membership thing next month they'll take us through this is real yeah we yeah it's unfortunate yeah I, this we've is been talking sort of about it for a while but now it's real yeah if you've enjoyed the show and i know so many of twit and leo's listeners have been listening to him and twit for decades you should think about the fact <laughs> sorry leo i didn't mean that in an ever, old way. And ever and ever <laughs> you're out there you know you could pick up your walker go over to the little piggy bank where you keep your coins hey i'm ready maybe, to retire i could retire and all of a sudden i like, don't want to retire there is stuff yeah, we need to talk about no. we, we need we yep. need to talk yep if this show or any of the shows on twitter have brought something to your life Consider supporting it financially. There's also a lot of great things you get from the club, but people need money to be able to produce things for you. Yep. And this era of being able to get podcasts and radio content and all of this stuff for total, like for nothing, it's over. So you got to figure out what's going to survive. And I hope that Twit can be one of the things that survives. Thank you. Well, as the newest member of the Twit family, I appreciate that, Paris Martin. No? Youth. Yes. Young person. <laughs> well, yeah. and Paris, you have you have brought oh. new blood, life, and spirit oh, to the show. Isn't it great, and it's wonderful. And um, folks out there, you gotta support. If you don't want to feed us, feed Paris. And we oh. are, by the way, we are talking because you made me feel bad when you said it was a show that you did with your grandparents. We are talking about hiring <laughs> another young woman to add to the mix so that you are not alone. <laughs> wow. And I really want to do that too. But again, it's going to really depend on uh, club membership. But uh, we have lots of ideas. We have lots of things we want to do. We're not done yet. Hey, the big, st we didn't even, we buried the lead. The big story of the week. Google's app store was ruled an illegal monopoly by a jury on Monday. An illegal. so good talking about Google. Monopoly. Yes. Say that. We're doing this for you. Um, Epic was suing Google just as they sued Apple. They lost kind of for the most part against uh, Apple in a, a trial that was uh, ruled by a single judge. This was for a jury, which deliberated for four hours and came back saying, yeah, you're monopoly. <laughs> Google says, we're going to, we're going to appeal. We're going to challenge. The price did not, did not go down much. Like the market thinks the, this might change on appeal. Yeah. Uh, and they're probably right. And even if it doesn't, it's going to go on for years. Oh, yeah. Actually, ju jury deliberated, deliberated three hours. They came back fast. It's uh, interesting. I think right maybe the day or so before the jury was supposed to deliberate, Google was like, oh, no, no. We actually want a judge to hear this, not yeah. a jury. Can Too late. We? Too late. Do you think, I mean, that's one of the big differences between the two trials. The other one, Tim Sweeney, I think it was of uh, Epic, said that uh, Apple... Google made the mistake of writing stuff down. <laughs> Apple, Apple didn't write <laughs> a lot of it down, and so they there weren't as many uh, documents they could use to prove their, you know, intent for monopoly. Uh, what What do you think is just right or wrong here? What is What are Google and Apple's rights in creating the store and the network for all these apps, and do they overstep or not? Just, I just do think a, that something that is interesting and different here is that. Apple makes no, you know, Apple is clear about the fact that it's a walled garden. Apple makes phones, sells them, and it also makes and maintains an app store. Obviously, Google makes phones as well, but many of 
the the Google Play Store is used on Samsung devices. It is used in an ecosystem that is far beyond just Google devices. And that's where it gets a bit more complicated here is because part of the question was, what does Google owe to these various different companies that it is, uh, you know, either trying to incentivize to keep the Google Play Store as their primary and only means of downloading apps like is it should it be allowed to put its finger on the scale like that yeah and this well, judge or, said or, no, or, or jury they, said no do they are they owed money for the value they bring to the app creators I mean, it could be like the old aol where nobody enter, enters in aol makes everything and says it's our space and that's that obviously the app makers allow them to scale the offerings at no cost to the platforms right um, but what's the value of that distribution? So there are precedents for the 30% VIG that Google and Apple both charge. That's what Microsoft charges in its Xbox store. That's what Nintendo charges in its Switch store. That's what Steam charges. It. There are costs to providing. It's what a ends. newsstand charges pretty much. Is it? Yeah. 26% or something like that. Yeah. So, so in, in that's, that's the reasonable payment you get for providing the store. I think that the question is, should people be forced to use that store? So if if a company like, in this case, Epic says, well, what we want is an Epic store and we won't, maybe they, maybe they could make a deal where we'll give you 3% or whatever because we are still running on your platform. Um, I think that that's not unfair to ask. Google and Apple's position is, it's risky to do that because there will be all sorts of stores with bad content and dangerous content. Apple especially feels this way. Uh, Which is true too, right? Yeah, absolutely true. Uh, Google gives, it, it's interesting that Google was the one that got in trouble here because uh, they're actually looser than Apple. You can sideload on an Android phone. There's just a, it's a fairly complicated process. Epic said it's too hard to do, uh, but you can. And so Google isn't a hundred percent locking you in. I can, you know, go into settings and on any Android device and say allow third-party app downloads, and it'll it'll allow it. You can download sideload. So I, it's interesting that the jury felt this way. I think they also were punishing Google for their business practices, things like, for instance, <clears throat> and Google gets in more trouble here than because they did the right thing initially. They Android is open source. And any handset maker can use the open source version of Android without any payment or, or debt to Google. But the problem is nobody wants an Android phone that's just the open source Android. They want the Google Play Store. They want Google Maps. They want the Google Apps. And Google says, well, well, we'll let you use Android open source for free. But if you want that stuff, then you have to bundle Chrome you have to bundle the Google Play Store. You have to follow all these rules. Otherwise, Android's brand is affected by crappy, miserable spaces. Which is a good point. So it's a good point. It's a good point. Uh, and it's a good protection for the consumer. How is the consumer hurt here? Prices higher, maybe. But look at the game world where it's wildly expensive and it's not kind of like this where you can, you know, you're in, in different platforms where, where you don't have this much competition. I honestly think Google's better in all of this because of side loading, because it's yep. open source, because they give you more choice. They probably should be be uh, prosecuted as the EU is prosecuting them for their business practices with these partners. I mean, the, you know, the the deals you make if you want to have the Google stuff on your phone are pretty draconian. Um, but I don't I don't think it's unreasonable to say we have an app store. We encourage people to use it. You can side load. I think that's fine. Apple is a different matter. Apple, there is no, you have to go through the Apple store. You have to give them 30%. Oh, and that was another thing the jury didn't like is that both Google and Apple have made secret deals with companies like Spotify and Netflix to, to lower the 30% um, because they're big customers or whatever. Well, at Amazon. And, and welcome to capitalism. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know how I feel about this. I think Google will actually in the win in the long run. I think the stock market's right that this will get overturned. But I yeah, I think what if, honestly, I think Apple should have lost and Google should have won. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the opposite. 
Supreme Court is, both Epic and Apple have gone to the U.S. Supreme Court on this store thing. Uh, so, because the judge did, even though Apple won most of its case, the judge did say, you gotta, you gotta have a, allow third-party stores. And so Apple and Google, Epic are uh, fighting this out in the Supreme Court. There will be, there will be more decisions on that one. It's the first, uh, according to The Wired, the first significant courtroom loss in the U.S. for big tech. And FTC has tried again and again and hasn't Can't seen do it until now. Yeah. And, this, and, and this was not FTC. This was a um, civil fight. Uh, Epic says the verdict is a win for all app developers and consumers around the world. It proves Google's app store practices are illegal and they abuse their monopoly to extract exorbitant fees, stifle competition, and reduce innovation. I don't think that's true. The fees no, are normal. Either. I think, I think their, prices, their prices are going to, if they have their own way, Epic, they're going to charge five times more. Because they'll be able to. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, result. It is. Kind of a shocker. Uh, and I think it is because it's a jury. It'll be interesting to see if it sticks. We should yeah. say, by the way, Google asked for a jury trial. They they And then changed their mind right, right at the Bulls. end. But... <laughs> So, yeah, I think this says more about it says more, and this is I have a book coming out next year about moral panic coverage of the of the internet. I think it says more about the um, effect of media's narrative about big bad tech companies than anything else, right? In the jury's mind, I don't know if tech com. You know, people are going to be mad at me because I'm so wishy washy. <laughs> I'm not sure big tech companies are all that big and all that dangerous. Okay, tell me more. Um, what are, what is the, how is, is Google harming you, Paris? No. No. I mean, I'm not no. in any position. Right. Uh, is Microsoft harming you? company is harming you. No, is, I mean. Is, is I Apple harming you? I have no personal qualms with any company that I could cover in the future. Um, <laughs> as, 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 oh, oh, you're um, just saying that because you don't want to appear biased. I mean, I'm saying that because it's true. Uh, okay. But How about also Amazon? Because, See, I think you can make a definitely claim. Definitely not. Amazon has harmed local retailers, but we have the ability a to shop. A and P I mean, harmed local re right. retailers. Walmart harmed local retailers. Yeah. I think a lot of yeah. things did. Home Depot. I think. I think. I think that large corporations generally and the rise of. Uh, monumental capitalism like mega corporations has harm has harmed the world and people in and we are extrapolating that and we are currently talking a lot about big tech because that is a trendy concise right. and very visible part of this ecosystem but the problem is more systemic i mean <sighs> Yes, uh, free market capitalism, which works quite well, fails when uh, one company becomes so dominant in a market, either as a monopoly or a monopsony, that they control the market. And that's why we have antitrust laws. And we should have, and antitrust is important. Uh, I think you can make the case that the, the tech uh, business is pretty competitive. And I don't know if it's, a, it's that kind of a trust. It's not standard oil. Um, Tell that to Neva. Uh, my little favorite uh, search engine. This is Benito weighing in. You're right. My little favorite search engine. Neva couldn't succeed as a search engine. But I don't think, I do, th I think we uh, assume that somehow these big tech companies have gotten so big that they have um, eliminated the business cycle. Like they're going to be big forever. Facebook, nobody can ever challenge Facebook. Wrong. Nobody can ever challenge Google. I think we're seeing that right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, I think and, the business and, and cycle still fronts. holds. And these companies are innovators, but but the next innovator still comes along no matter what happens. And that's what you're trying to, by the way, that's what antitrust law is trying to do is to protect both consumers in prices. That's a little hard to justify because prices seem to be going down with big tech, but also to protect, protect new companies so that innovation can happen. Yeah, the problem with Neva, too, was, and I write about this in magazine, my cute little book out now, is customer acquisition cost. 
And, you know, when AW started, when Entertainment Weekly started, we had to pay $45 a head for every subscriber we ended up getting. Yeah. Just in marketing costs, right? right. We lost money on everybody. Right. And so if you're a new company like Neva, you're going to, you're going to sustain on consumer revenue. And you're not Twit Network, which already has a loyal base, which should be paying more. Uh, that's different. <laughs> you already have the audience. We just need 5% of you guys who listen. <laughs> wonderful, it? You guys are really taking up the Sorry. charge. I love it. You're Thank you. That we are. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but Neva had to be out there in a, in a tough market and acquire new people and get them to pay uh, uh, quickly. That's a hard business no matter what. Whatever you're starting, the subscription business is really, really hard. And can you blame Google for that? Well, yeah, it's hard to fight against a really well-established search engine that people really like and trust. I yeah, And I don't think that it's imp – for a long time I thought maybe there was – uh, uh, an issue of scale that it would be impossible to come up with a search engine as good as Google. Now I realize that, yes, if you wanted to duplicate Google's search, that might be hard, but Google's doing a pretty good job of screwing it up. And I think there are opportunities out there, well, there and it may are. not be Absolutely in a traditional you know, web crawling search engine. It might be an AI, but there are opportunities for search and for Google to be uh, disintermediated, to be dis disintermediated, you know, to be uh, and, and look at taken Facebook out of the and Twitter and company, uh, Mastodon, uh, Oigan Rochko raised no more than five hundred thousand dollars to get to example. twelve million users. Yeah, it's a perfect example. And he was the yeah. only full time person. It was him and volunteers. It's people like Leo who started their own instances and did that. That's a different model. Neva could have gone for a different model now. I don't know what that was. And I, I don't mean to make their business. It was really hard. Um, and, and the problem with a business like Neva is they had a high upfront cost. Yeah, it's, it's a, that's the problem is create a search yeah. index. It uh, costs money. It's very, very tough. Uh, in fact, nobody really does it. They just license Bing for the most part. Um, which is not really a good solution. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm less, I don't know. Something happened where I got kind of the feeling that I'm not that worried about the big tech guys because I think they're going to be the source you know what of their I'm worried own about? demise, actually. I, I think you're right, Leo. What I'm worried about, though, what I've become worried about, I became worried about writing the next book, is the crazy end, the loony end of the tech boys. Well, I'm much more worried about the billionaires. I agree. I think if there's a threat to us, it's not from companies, it's from individuals. Breed. Yeah. Yes, it's a certain breed of them. And so that effective uh, uh, accelerationism story you mentioned, that's really kind of a mockery of affection, uh, uh, effective altruism. Right. And they're all trying to pull on a cloak of religion for what they do. They're dangerous. Yeah, I agree. Because it's really just uh, a justification, a rationalization. Absolutely. Yeah, for SBF type behavior. All right, let's take a break. Uh, I, w I have so much more I'd like to talk about. Well, there's tons. This is a, you know, we <laughs> Google's given up the Google Play movies and TV. Finally, they said they would. Now, if you want to buy a movie, you have to buy it, like, I don't know, in some other part of the interface, I guess. <laughs> I don't. God knows where. I don't. I don't. Yeah. It's why do they do this? I don't. Four know. Four people know where. Yeah. You, you'll find. We're it. We're never going to find out. If you'll need it, you'll find it. Two million Teslas are being recalled. It finally happened. The National Highway Transportation Safety Administration said, "Yeah, uh, autopilot. Uh, it's a little hard. It's not. It's uh, dangerous. Doesn't do enough to guard against misuse. Their chief issue is drivers." who assume they have autopilot and get in the back seat or start reading a book or take a nap. And they say Tesla has to fix their automobile to keep drivers engaged, that their methods are inadequate. Right now, it's just a torque sensor in the steering wheel. My, my car is like that, too. It says, you know, grab the wheel, make sure we know you're still alive. But my car, <laughs> many other cars have cameras, too, that tell when you're doing hands-free that whether you're looking at the road or not so if i'm got my hands-free blue cruise on my ford and i look over here about 10 seconds in it's going to go hey hey look at the road does it buzz your steering yeah. wheel oh it's fun and it beeps it's obnoxious as hell but it gets me uh back paying attention and which is by the way a good idea yeah fcc Oh, I love this one. Speaking of, screw you, Elon. FCC has denied a Starlink subsidy of nearly a billion dollars, 885 
million dollars in public funds. This was part of the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which was designed to subsidize the rollout of internet service in in rural areas, places where private companies have said, "Man, well, we're not going to do it." The first eight hundred eighty-five million was set aside for Starlink three years ago, based on the company's bid to how much connectivity it could provide at what cost and to what regions. The FCC said, now that that initial approval was, you know, high level, but without scrutiny, we now we're looking at it a little bit closer. And uh, the FCC says, well, the satellite internet proposal has promise, but it's still a developing technology. And they noted that in order to use Starlink, you have to buy a dish for 600 bucks and then pay more than 100 bucks a month for service. Oof. <laughs> Uh, the FCC said that's not exactly providing service to underserved communities. Uh, this was in addition to... I love that they literally <laughs> said the company, quote, failed to demonstrate that it could deliver the promised service, end yes. quote, which is as close to a burn as you're ever going to get from a government yeah. agency. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. Uh, unfortunately, the satellites are already up there. Fortunately, unfortunately, I was just, I really ho had high hopes that Starlink would do exactly that. But as soon as they started saying how much it was going to cost, it's like it's for rich people. It's not for normal people. And he depends so much on government money for all of yeah, this. Yeah, that's a big, po big point. Of Low that, heart rate. Right? Uh, get ready. Cyber war has broken out between the Ukraine and Russia, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, Ukraine intelligence says they attacked and brought down the Russian tax service for multiple days, and then in an unrelated, I don't know, attack, the other day, just a couple of days ago, Ukraine's largest telecom operator was shut down after a cyber attack. Got to think it's Russia, right? Uh, the company said it was hit by a powerful cyber attack that led to a large-scale technical failure. This is one of the things I've always worried about is cyber warfare, uh, and it's happening, I think, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Netflix, for the first time ever, has released information about viewing, which is a big deal. One of the re and I think they deal with this because uh, of the Hollywood writers and actors strikes, and because producers also say, "Look, you know, it's nice that you're giving me ninety million dollars to make this series, but I really want to know how many people saw it." So they've released. But the it go ahead. They've released viewing numbers for eighteen thousand titles. Uh, between January and June of this year. Go ahead. Well, what's interesting about this to me is that it's not, if you're, if you're presenting a show on network linear broadcast television, you want a huge audience because you're going to sell that audience to advertisers. Netflix is an entirely different business, even though it's added advertising, but it, it's the business of trying to get, people of many, many different interests along the tail to find enough of value on Netflix to subscribe to it for every month. So the largest show is A, going to be much smaller than anything that was on broadcast, and B, that isn't as important. Not it's not important global. to Netflix, but it's important to the actors who want residuals and aren't getting paid residuals, to the producers who want to know that they go into the right. market now. Oh, we had 100 million viewers. So the, the, the people who produce this content do want to know. I agree, Netflix. But I'm also saying, to. right, but, but I'm also saying, though, is that the actual monetary value, the economic value to Netflix is not necessarily consistent. I agree. With a top-down sure. list. I agree. Um, and, and because it may be something that's smaller, but really addicts people, and they're your most loyal customers, you don't have to, you know, pay that market to get them to renew, um, then the size of the audience doesn't matter. And I think this is, this is what I really want to work on after the Atlanta type book is this question about scale and mass. We, we still have this assumption of it from the old broadcast days and mass media print days where big was all that mattered. That's just not true now. Well, the good news is they don't release numbers yeah. in the same way that, that we're used to seeing numbers for TV shows. Uh, you know, how many families mm -hmm. watched or, uh, you know, what the ratings were, the share the biggest title on Netflix in the first half of the year was The Night Agent, which I do recommend. Great show. I was about to say, have you guys heard of this? I hadn't no, even heard had of this. No, not heard of it. Nope. Oh, it's good. You like Watch it, Leo? It. Yeah. You were one of those hours? I was one of the 812 million hours of viewing. That's, that's how they released the number, which is 
meaningless. Well, it's apples and oranges if you're if you're talking about you know network yeah. television viewership. Season two of a show I have not heard of, Ginny and Georgia, was second. Have you guys heard of Ginny and Georgia? Nope. But no this idea. is what Jeff was saying: is that the Netflix is based on quantity, a tale, right? Yeah. yeah. Six hundred sixty-five million hours. The Korean drama, The Glory was third. Never heard of that. I, okay, have. I will say one thing that is very interesting about this is they say um, about 55% of viewing overall was for like originals, Netflix originals, and 45% was for licensed shows and films. Suits dominated the streaming charts for most of the summer and fall and had a combined about 600 million hours of viewing worldwide on Netflix, which is fascinating to me because I, for some, I noticed this. I didn't watch Suits, but it suddenly seemed like everyone I knew this fall was watching Suits. Yeah, it was, it was, which is weird because it's an older was show. That, was that because of The Princess? No, it's because I asked some friends and they said it was just the first thing on Netflix, like yeah. every single day for a month. Yeah, it was yeah. up at the top. I think Did it was initially because of Meghan Markle. I tried, I wa but I don't like Netflix. But you clicked. Television. I clicked. I watched the first. There I we think go. I watched an episode. Oh, he, he, yeah. He, this is how he buys stuff on Instagram. He's a, he's a, <laughs> a sop. He's a clicker. <laughs> yeah, I'm a yeah. clicker. Don't click. Uh, so the the by the way the number four show which I did like a lot was called Wednesday. You remember that? That was a great show. Five hundred million hours of viewing. Not as much as Suits. Is Su that the Wednesday Adams one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Not the third day of the week. Listen, I thought maybe they really went in a deep dive about <laughs> the third day of the week. Bridgerton, HBO Queen Drama. Charlotte was uh, fifth. You, season four, was sixth. La I Reina didn't watch del a single season. thing yeah. on this list until you get down to The Diplomat. Isn't that interesting? Diplomat I was very good. I haven't seen a single thing. Oh, wait, no. I saw Love is Blind season four. Other than that, I've wait seen nothing on is this Is that list. a reality show where you have to it date somebody is, without seeing and listen, them? listen, yes. And my explanation is not going to make this sound any cooler. I watched it. <laughs> okay, if you're Netflix, if you work at Netflix, turn off your ears. I watched this. There is a podcast I listen to. I don't really watch The Bachelor, but I've gotten really into this podcast called Game of Roses that analyzes The Bachelor like a sport. They specifically like try to money ball Even it. Even though you break. don't watch The Bachelor. You, no, you I don't. But I'm fascinated else. by these people analyzing the episodes and analyzing reality TV as a genre in the same way that like, you know, uh, popular American sports are. And one of the hosts did a breakdown on their Patreon of Love is Blind season four, kind of mystery science theater 3000 style, where it's like picture in picture. And he kept stopping it to comment on the different plays. I mean, part of being on reality TV is figuring out how to play the game correctly yes. to both appeal to the audience that's watching, but then also make smart moves with the producers. So I watched Love is Blind season four, but not on Netflix. I watched it on a weird Patreon mystery science theater 3000 stream <laughs> that was I don't know if they get credit for that <laughs> they don't, yeah, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> that's hysterical I don't stop at Netflix yeah yeah um, other stories let's see uh, the CEO of Sports Illustrated was fired I know him uh, well, I the don't have the parent company yeah over it. is he a fall guy on that. this or did he really yeah, I think so I think so. They uh, fired him because... I mean, it was a stupid move because they... It's they, really stupid. They had a company... It's like Cadet did the same thing. They had a company produce reviews for them. Now, wouldn't you think a review should be done by a human being who makes a judgment? No. It's just generic crap content they're going to turn out. They don't, not only made up the reviews, supposedly, but also the authors didn't really exist. So it was a lie to the public. And, and These were purchased um, not, uh, they weren't from Sports Illustrated, they were purchased no. content to run in the Sports Illustrated website. I had somebody from another company say, when I complained about the AI use, you don't understand, Jeff, we're in a war out here with reviews, that you're trying to get the SEO yeah. for these air quotes so it's reviews. it's a crap review or a meaningless review. Yeah, of course. But somebody's yeah, going to be typing, like I was looking for reviews of Killers of the Flower Moon, and- it's there, so I'll click it, and they get the click. They, they get the view. It doesn't matter if the review doesn't even talk about They also about want, to, they want to fool Google. It's a machine fooling right. the machine. They want SEO, uh, and, and, and they want algorithm love 
in social as well. It's so like it getting fired for running Outbrain content, to be honest. The third party company. At least you get money from Outbrain. <laughs> the third Wait, party company that I made have a these. Question. Yes. Was, were these reviews of products or were they of content like movies and things like that? I don't know, to be honest. Because if they were reviews of con of products, I think that's. I think there are products. Because, I mean, these like we're are, talking about, the thing that they're optimizing for is they want to get the click through, right? So that they then get a portion of whatever the, you buy uh, the uh, affiliate fees. Yeah, I think so yeah. because it says these were commerce articles, which sounds yeah. to me like they're. I products. mean, that is a product reviews. Yeah, a dark and concerning part of the of the quote unquote journalism industry. They came from a company it's called Advon A D V O N Commerce. Um, uh, vomit. Uh, uh, yeah. They are AI written, and they're really, they're just link bait, is all they are. Written by non-existent writers with AI-generated profile pictures. But Arena Group, which publishes was, was Sports Futurism. Illustrated, fired the Ross Levinson, the CEO, uh, for doing well, it. Yeah, which and, I think and, is, and go on, he's kind of a Say who's guy. now in charge. Keep going, keep going. Uh, who's in charge? Maj Manaj Bar Bargava will serve as Arena and Group's what interim do? chief executive officer. This, so did they, they went and did they hire the former editor of Sports Illustrated? Did they hire no. a former CEO of the they New York hired Times? A money did person. they hire somebody? Yeah. No. What did he? What does he? No. 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 Keep going. What does he do? Look, search his name. Oh, okay. Uh, he's known for. He's uh, known. He, he, Let's see what drink. he's known he's an for. An energy drink guy. He what? Yes. <laughs> Not a journalist. That'll solve our PR problem. He's an Let's Indian American idea. businessman and philanthropist, the founder and CEO of Innovations Ventures. Known for producing the five hour energy drink. There it is. Yeah. Oh That's a guy God. you want in charge yes. of your editorial content. That's going to be everything responsible is fine. I, I, I am sure he's a very nice guy, but why did they fire Levinson and put him in? What were they trying to say? The problem is that when Time, Inc., when, when Time Warner and all that broke up, nobody wanted the magazine company. And so one by one, it was split off. Time went to it's really sad. Um, Salesforce. Yeah. Fortune went to a tech, to a Thai businessman. Yeah. So sad. And Sports Illustrated went to a marketing, a cheap marketing company, which is what this is. And then the rest got sold to Meredith and Meredith got sold to uh, Dot Dash. And well, so it so happens that I have a magazine out now as an elegy to the magazine because it's really sad stuff happening. It is sad. Magazines yeah. are actually dying faster before our eyes than newspapers. Yeah. All because of the internet, um, and they didn't—they didn't keep up. They didn't know what to do. The advertising market. I mean, who wants to buy time? You don't need a general interest publication. Um, Vogue used to be this thick in September, and now it's you know getting thin enough to shave with. Um, uh, Bloomberg Popular Business Science Week just went from weekly to monthly. Monthly, oh, really? Uh, Bloomberg Business Nation went from bi-weekly to monthly. Bi-weekly, yeah. Popular Science is dead uh, completely now. Um, uh, Wired Sports just laid off like 20 um, people department. from yep. their features, desk, science desk, print, web. Magazines are dying right now before our very eyes because they depended upon thinking that they had high value content for subscriptions and high value audience to advertisers. And and neither is valuable anymore because the, I, what I already argue in my book, Magazine on Sale Now, is that they missed the opportunity to understand that they were actually communities like this, like Twit. Hmm. Well, you know, honestly, what's happening in media um, is happening in podcasting. Uh, it's happening. It's uh, you said it last week. I, I, agencies, ad buyers are driven by uh, fads, by what's the next new thing. And it's happening so fast. It's cycling so fast now that, uh, you know, it'll be influencers and YouTube next year and it'll be something else the year after. Uh, my son leaped, leapfrogged smart from TikTok to Instagram. I keep telling him, keep leaping because <laughs> everything's yeah. moving. It's uh, well, How did the Cheetos hour go? Uh, I don't know, but I'm excited. My Cheetos duster arrived today. I can't wait to go home and use it. <laughs> wait, did you say Cheetos duster? Yeah. You have a Dodge car, a Dodge painted As Cheetos As in orange? a like a large coat that is Cheetos? It sounds brand? like that, but it's not. It's just basically one of those magic <sighs> bullet things you know that um oh my god i want a cheetos brand duster the oh that would be the cool piece of clothing now that, that would, would be, be very cool, cool. Oh, I know. cheetos be... get in my dms yeah hanks uh <laughs> hanks hey did you ever get the twa stuff no 
Hey. hey, they said they're going to send it to us. Hey. Yeah. Hey. hey. Can you see we're what? space agent here? And as Lisa it. pointed out, they, they didn't want to give us anything. They just wanted us to mention it on the show again because Paris mentioned the TWA hotel and they were going to send us swag and they didn't. See, Lisa was hey. on to this. She, she, she caught on. Oh, yeah, she knew. She knew. Yeah. Here is the, uh, the Henry Laporte Cheetos stream oh. from last week on Amazon. And oh, uh, he, had deals, ah, he ah. had deals on the Cheeto duster. Uh, he was uh, he was selling the Cheeto dusters, basically home shopping. Uh, he made three dishes with Cheetos, including uh, Cheetos caramel popcorn, uh, oh, Cheetos <laughs> Cheetos tamales. Look, he's taken tamales and he's taken uh, flaming hot Cheetos and he's du he's dusted them in the Cheetos duster, and then he's uh, drizzling the Cheetos dust on the on the tamales. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, I thought I would just, I thought I would buy, I just ended up buying it just to support the lad, a, uh, a fine <laughs> Cheetos duster. And I'm told it arrived today. So look, it comes oh, with fingerprints, hilarious. uh, pre fingerprinted, perfecting Cheetos dust. I okay, guess I'll have so to buy. The thing it does is it, it grinds up the Cheetos. It's a Cheeto grinder. Them into dust. That's all it does. So you can, you can Cheeto anything. Yeah. Okay. And you probably don't want to use it for anything else once you've used it for Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much maintains the Cheeto tang uh, forever after. So you want a dedicated Cheetos duster, I think. Um, <laughs> he God, did, they got to get a good on job. that large coat. I am so proud of oh. my son, the Cheetos <laughs> guy. Uh, all right. What else? Uh, I think we can uh, we can wrap her up here. Uh, there is a change log, but I think I, oh Google Google Maps is doing more stuff. Really? That's it. Oh my god! Yeah. Huge. <laughs> I was say, always wondering when they were going to do that. They're going to do more stuff, and it's good stuff. Press the blue dot. Our show today. We're going to get your picks in just a second. Wrap this up. Our show today brought to you by. The I got a text from somebody the other day. He said, you know, of all the advertisers you've talked about on the show, I love Fastmail. I've been looking for a, a, a email provider, and I am so happy, so happy that I switched to Fastmail. If you're using free email, and almost everybody is, right? Everybody's using Gmail or Outlook.com or some Yahoo. I still get emails from people with AOL and Earthlink subscriptions. Uh if you're using free email or worse, ISP-based email, they're spying on you. They're monetizing you. They're showing you ads. You want to go, if you're not, if you're not the customer, you're the product. That's why if you're not paying, you're they're going to take money out of your hide somehow. That's why you want fast mail. But it, but I got to tell you, it's, it's inexpensive. It's as low as three dollars a month. You get the best email service. And, and you can have your own domain if you're a business and you're still getting email at gmail.com. That's just not professional seeming. You want to have, you know, a, a, an email domain. Fastmail sells domains. You can buy the domains or you can bring your own domain name over. That's what I do with almost all my domain names. So I still have a website, say, at leo.fm, but, I, but I, ho I, have, I have the email hosted by Fastmail. Very easy to set up. That way, when somebody sends me email to my website, I get it through Fastmail. Fastmail also allows you to create masked email addresses. If you use Bitwarden or 1Password, you can actually create unique custom email addresses for every login, along with a unique custom password, doubling your security. Because nobody can guess it. It's completely random. But it still comes to you. It's so brilliant. The Fastmail server is a real IMAP server. In fact, they use the open source Cyrus server. They contribute back to that project, by the way. They're good citizens of the open source community. Uh, it works with everything you're already using. So if you're using a, an, a, an application on your phone or on your desktop, Apple Mail or uh, Microsoft Outlook, it'll work just fine with that. They, I know a lot of people like web-based mail. You're not giving that up either. Fastmail has an excellent web mail. Uh, in fact, with Fastmail's webmail, you can ch customize your workflow with colors, swipes. There's night mode for you, Paris. There's day mode for you, uh, uh, Jeff. There's quick settings. In fact, the quick settings are great because you can switch modes without leaving the Fastmail screen. 
you know, you're you're looking at your mail and you just go, oh, this is too bright. Turn it down. And you could do that right there. Um, it will auto save contacts if you want. I turn that on because then if I send email to somebody, automatically their email is no longer sent to spam because it's somebody I'm having a, a conversation with. You that uses Gravatar to put public images in so you can see what people look like as you're emailing them. They have a great iOS app. I use that instead of Apple's app. They have a great uh, Android app. I use that instead of Gmail or any other app or Samsung Mail. It, it's just fantastic. For 20 years, Fastmail has been a leader in email, email privacy. They work for you as customers, people to be cared for, not a product to be exploited. Better spam filters, of course, no ads. Superior productivity. It's easy to move. You can download your old data, import it into your new fast mail inbox, or automatically fetch your mail or have your mail forwarded. So you can keep that old address for a while, as long as you want, uh, and so that you don't miss any mail, slowly move over to fast mail. I can go on and on. In fact, I have. <laughs> Just go. Do me a favor. Reclaim your privacy. Boost your productivity with Fastmail. You can try it now free for 30 days. Fastmail.com slash twit. I've been a Fastmail customer for more than a decade. I moved over from Gmail. And I just I just love it. Fastmail.com slash twit. Twit. The scriptability alone makes it worth it because I can. I have hundreds of folders. Mail is automatically sorted for me. I never miss an email. I never have a false positive on spam. Uh, it's just great. Fastmail.com slash twit. Make email yours. <sighs> Thank you. Cessna says, I use Fastmail because of Leo. Thank you. I see. I, I talk to people all the time. It actually is almost a litmus test for geekery. You ask somebody what your email provider is, and if they say Fastmail, you know they know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. Paris, do you have a thing? You, I, by the way, I, 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 I've been running We Croak, your thing on the phone, and it oh, keeps yeah? telling me I'm going to die. <laughs> it does that five times a day. Five times a day. You got to remember. It's good. It's good. I haven't gone to a cemetery yet to sit in somebody's good. grave. But I will be Listen, doing. you got until Sunday. I do. Um, I do. That was a good Yeah, I've got a really good two pick. things Thank you. Okay. Uh, pick-wise. One is Variety just published this article this week about um, Dropout, the kind of indie streaming service I think that I talked about a couple of weeks ago. Their CEO um, spoke with Variety about the insane year that they've had. Um, and they have... This is a company that, you know, started from basically nothing when IAC dropped them. It used to be College Humor. Oh, it was College and Humor. In the last oh, yeah, year, yeah, yeah. they uh, have doubled their streaming subscribers <gasps> Good to, for meet, them. to meet the mid six. They're in the mid six figures right now. They did this by just kind of like doubling down on their uh, like their Dungeons and Dragons actual play content. You're, and you're a Dimension they 20 have a fan, aren't you? I think you I'm a are. big fan of yeah, that. Yeah. They have a variety of different uh, improv-based shows. Oh. But this year, they were not only profitable, but they're profitable enough that they've done profit sharing with all of their employees and anyone who's like ever worked for them this year. Oh, um, that's fantastic. And so... They're, you know, they've got 17 full-time staffers, they said. They're uh, planning on expanding next year and releasing a bunch of new shows. It's just a really great article at and a fantastic look at an indie media company that is thriving, which is so rare in this Yay. day and age. Are they ad-supported? So, it? Oh, it's subscription. No, it's subscription. Yeah. Yes, that's why. Um, and yeah. they were able to really take off because... One, I mean, they started with just kind of a very niche content that they were producing and they were just really producing this, you know, Dimension 20, a Dungeons and Dragons show during the pandemic, as well as a couple of other kind of game shows with improvisers they did over Zoom. But they found a lot of success over some of their, um, if you look them up on TikTok or YouTube shorts, they found incredible success because some of their improv based shows translate really well to being short little clips and have gone so phenomenally viral. They said that a lot of their now hundreds of thousands of subscribers have come from that, um, which is, you know, a really, a really great story in this terrible it is. time. It is. Uh, and they were smart to start from uh, the beginning with subscribers, I guess they have roughly the same number of 
sub, uh, subscribers as we have viewers. Uh, and and we know if we could if we could monetize everyone who watches our shows, we'd be we'd be launching game shows too. <laughs> I'd be doing I'd be doing all sorts of stuff. That's really cool. Good yeah. for them. I wondered what happened to College Humor. I loved College Humor. Yeah, I mean, what happened was right before the pandemic struck, they fired IAC fired everybody. Wow. And uh, uh, this guy, the CEO Sam Reich, ended up getting the company from IAC. I think for free or a nominal amount took over Good for him. The, the company went from 105 people to seven overnight yeah, and wow. then the pandemic struck. And so they just tried treading water for about eight months and have been on the up since. Do then. they produce all their shows in house or do they buy content? They do. They do. They produce it all in house. Wow. Um, and I think the thing that has really helped is it's all like improv based comedy rather than scripted. Um, so the costs are for, they obviously still pay writers and stuff and are pretty transparent about their cost structures, but they've been able to kind of make it work as a business model. Very interesting. The magic My of other improv. Pick, yes. It's honestly fantastic. They had Wayne Brady on a, oh, he's great on one of their shows recently. And he's like, you guys are the second coming of whose line. Yeah. Um, whose line is it anyway? So it was a great highly show. Recommend yeah. it. They've got some stuff on YouTube as well. Uh, my other pick is uh, a video game that came out like four years ago, so it's not new, but I, it's new to me. I recently started playing Outer Wilds, which I'd highly recommend for anyone who's not a real gamer. Um, it is a kind of fun mystery game. You're a, I guess, like a member of some alien race. You're essentially a spacer. You're going to be launched up in space. It's a thing that people in your society do. You can go explore kind of like these different worlds around it, but there's kind of a mystery afoot and you've got to try and figure out what's going on. But the interesting hook of this game is that part of the mystery is you're stuck in a time loop. So like every, you wake up, you get in your little rocket, and then after 22 minutes of playing the game, the sun explodes, and you have to do it all over again. <laughs> I love it. And so you've got to figure That's out awesome. what's happening with that. But it's a really interesting mechanic because, I mean, I'm not a particularly dexterous gamer. There's a reason why I like turn-based stuff. I'm not super great at, you know, moving. So you have to, like, fly a rocket through this, and probably my first 10 loops, I just crashed into the sun or something. It was deeply embarrassing, but it doesn't matter because death doesn't matter in this game because it's, it just starts all over. We all start Cause, over. Cause as, as Paris would say, nothing matters. It's true. <laughs> nothing matters, guys. So it's a really great game. It looks kind of like No Man's Sky with a plot. Which is, I think, a very good concept. <laughs> That's yeah, really neat. It's, yeah, uh, yeah, it's gorgeous. They have like all these different worlds that you can go to that have very different physics, like gravity, oh, you know, um, as well as like a, a strange like ecosystems. I highly recommend it. Nice, uh, and it's on it's Steam, uh, PS4, PS5, Xbox, Switch. Do you play it on your Switch? Um, no, I've been playing it on my Steam Deck. Steam Deck, really that's like right. That. You have a Steam Deck. I forgot. Yeah, my Switch has been relegated to the cabinet since oh, I got the deck. Oh, no. It's fine. Poor little Switchy. It's hard. Jeff Jarvis, number of the week. I think we should, I'm going to mention two things real fast. Not going to do but just follow up from last week. Apple cut off Beeper Mini, which we talked about last week, and then they came back, and now they're going to cut it off again. So who knows what that's going to look I'm like. using it right now, and it works. Uh, and then the other thing to cat and mention. mouse game that's very interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Zuck uh, threaded today, whatever the verb is, that they are starting to test Federation at least one way. Oh, with activity pop. line eighty-eight. Oh, oh now so we run a mask gonna, on a twit social. I would love to. You're not going to be able to. Threads. You're not going to be able to publish from twit social onto Threads. At first, it's the opposite. And That's you fine. Can't export your your um, uh, social graph yet, but, but it it's the first step toward federation. Us access to people who are only on Threads, their content could live on. That's social. what it would seem. They're going to do it very slowly, wow. uh, but I thought that was worth mentioning. Uh, and then we can do the year in search because the year is coming toward an end. Oh, I love that Google does that every year. They used to call it Zeitgeist. And then they also did it. Yeah, and they also did it for the years past. Oh. So uh, this year, um, 
a lot of the people, I have no idea who they are. I'm that old. <laughs> so, Demar uh, Hamlin. Demar Hamlin's a football right? player who almost died Jeremy on Renner. the field. Jeremy Renner got eaten by a snowplow. Uh, he's a famous oh, uh, right, movie and guy. TV star. Andrew Tate, we well, don't want to talk we about. We don't want to talk about him. Although he's back on uh, Twitter along with Alex Jones. And in fact, yes. Elon had his spaces with the two of them. And God. a presidential candidate who peed while on the show. What he said, he announced it, I'm peeing? No, he, people heard him. He was peeing. He didn't, he didn't <laughs> mute himself. He forgot to mute himself. <laughs> <laughs> what? Which, which presidential candidate? Which? Yes. Vivek. Guess which one. Yes. Not Vivek, Vivek Ramaswamy. Yes. On oh. the first guess. What an oh. unbelievable. You know what? He might have done that on purpose. It's well, a good, to show he's, dominance. He's, he, yeah, to show dominance. You have to, <laughs> yeah. you have to pee on the stream. That's, <laughs> that's what we do with our organs, yes. Who's yeah, Kylie yeah. and Mbappe? I don't know that. Kylian Mbappe. Do you know that, uh, Benito? You, I do not. He sounds like an athlete, maybe? Yeah, it might be an athlete. Travis well, Kelsey Benito is. everything. And he is. But Travis Kelsey, even I know. Even you know that. That's global. This is, I always love this. Games, Hogwarts Legacy, number one. That's just, what happened to that? That fell off the face of the earth real quick. Last of Us, Connections, Battlegrounds, Mobile, India, and Starfield. For recipes, I like seeing Bim Bap right at the top there. Uh, musicians Shakira J why Shakira Jason Aldean Joe Jonas Smash Mouth you're still on global right yeah should I go to US we have I'm a global audience I don't see it in the list oh we, we're not in we don't have that not information included. there it is there it's it is down there. US not it's included there. There uh, it is. so very similar we Tucker have Carlson and Little Tay are there God <laughs> Um, the war in Israel and Gaza, of course, number one, right above the Titanic submarine. <laughs> wait, wait, who was searching for Lil Tay in 2023? <laughs> Did he die? I always think that must be. Oh, good. was that? There was a time. I guess that must have been this year where Lil Tay was announced to be dead, but oh. she wasn't. It was a hoax. Ah, so. that's why. Right. That's, that's why. why. Yeah. It was a hoax. So it might be more interesting if you go back to the rundown. The next line yeah. is from 1999 through today. <laughs> the trends time so, capsule. So if you go down in the trends time capsule. Oh, we should have done the quiz. Shows. Shoot. Oh, no. We can maybe make that be a, 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 a twig. Well, this extra. is where we're all time. We can do the twig after. You want to do the, the twig, twig after, after show? We'll do the quiz. Yeah. All right. All right so go down to go down to a TV shows, for example. Yeah. Okay. This is. Uh, Not reality. Keep going is, down, down, the other way, the other way. What's the down. alphabet? S T. Okay. There, TV shows. Yeah. Right, so now you Simpsons, see. Simpsons, Simpsons, Simpsons. Oh, Simpsons took a plunge. Wow, this is interesting. In 2006, they lost out to Lost. Yeah. And oh, and then Prison Break comes for the break. win in 2007 and 2008. Yeah. And the Simpsons, Simpsons comes back, back and Glee. Then Glee. Then Game Empire of Thrones for Game of Thrones five had years. Five years. Big, big run. run. Big run. Wow. This is fun. This is, is fun. Wednesday. Uh, I don't know what that is. Last of Us. Those are newer. That stuff. says a lot of that, that says a lot about, about the state of TV today. Yeah. Is it the it gets number fragmented. one show we don't know? Yeah, it's fragmented. Yeah. Uh, fun. This is really uh, cool. All right. Maybe after uh, after we wrap this up, we'll do a uh, for the club, we'll do take the quiz. In the trends time capsule. These Google Trends thing is so interesting. Isn't it? And go down and it has one, I'm in the US one, and under the subheading, how often, I guess it's the questions that begin with how often people search. Number one is, how often do you think about the Roman <laughs> Empire? That was, of course, a TikTok <laughs> trend. Uh, yeah. Yep. That's good. That's good. Where you ask men how often they think about the Roman yeah. Empire. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't Number thought about Number five it is how now. often do trains derail, which is wow. Weak. That's how, that's a common how often search, huh? All right, here we go. Recipe number one: grimace shake. Number two: lasagna. Do you, soup. Do you guys know what the grimace shake mm. is? Yeah, no. it's at McDonald's, right? Yeah, it's a McDonald's shake based on grimace, the right. McDonald's guy, but it became a big online. Meme. Right, it was a thing. Was the thing online? Did you look at the menu for Cosmics? Where? What? Cosmics.com. C O S M C S. This is McDonald's new chain they're trying to start. They're trying to fight Starbucks. 
Oh, uh, what you is get diabetes? C O S M C S. Yeah, yeah, I'm on it. But what is what? It, what it, so it's a McDonald's the menu. But it's, it's well, it's only drive through. They only have one. And it's in only Illinois. drinks. Well, no, it's not only. Go to the menu. Go up. Go up. No, go oh my okay. God! But this is diabetes and explore fog. Exactly. <laughs> explore full menu. They don't have hamburgers. There's no hamburgers. Oh, sour don't. cherry energy bus. Don't drink uh, this burst. Crap. Oh. Sour Tango Lemonade. Okay, wait. Oh. Speaking of crap, do you guys know about the Panera Lemonade that kills you? No. I've it, heard. Yeah, it's, I've heard, yes. but tell wow. me. Tell me. I mean, I've heard We've people lived, say that. It, Does it actually kill you? There is a Panera Bread Lemonade that they had have, I guess, still called the Charge Lemonade. It comes in a bunch of different flavors. Is it alcoholic? That has, I believe, no. no, it has 390 milligrams of caffeine, <laughs> caffeine. in it, ah! which is an insane amount of caffeine. I think this is the the large size. So that's a lot like of two cups of coffee. Order, yeah. yeah. I can't like have four. any caffeine. And I wouldn't know if right. I went, I like lemonade. That's all I drink is lemonade because I don't have caffeine. I can't have Coke anymore. Right. If I went there, it would kill me. It actually has more caffeine than a Red Bull or a Monster Energy drink. But not quite yeah, as much I, as a so, Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> 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 and whatever bang is, don't drink it. Don't Whatever drink bangs. the bangs because it's got it's got twenty milligrams of caffeine per ounce. So I mean, it's not, really people died of cardiac arrest from drinking it. Yeah, I mean, ostensibly to because you know, it's the it's free side of it, the people ha who died had uh, they drank heart twelve issues. of issues. Yeah, you know, they're like, sitting there all day. This is good. It is true. The physicians reasons. recommend that you consume no more than four hundred milligrams of grams of caffeine a day, which is four or five so cups of coffee. So that would be one this big is, this Panera lemonade. This is 390. Lemonade. So have two and you're dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so it's be. become a big thing online because the idea of a lemonade that kills you is quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> but not nearly in, as funny in Paris's nihilistic as view. a signature galactic boost from Cosmics. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, they do have some Sandwiches. Foods. Wait. Jeff, why yes. do we hate this? Why do we hate Cosmics? Because, uh, because <laughs> it's, 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 it's going to, it's going to, it's going to make America Look, obesity even They worse. sell McPoops. That's good. It looks like McPoop too. Okay. Caramel fudge brown. Oh, this is sugar. I it's just hate a, hazelnut It's a sugar coffee. shack. This is sugar, sugar shack. You hate All hazelnut? Sugar. Oh yeah. I wouldn't. When that I was is the in, worst take you've ever had on this show. <laughs> Hot when I, I hate sugar, I had when I was the boss hazelnut. of Entertainment Weekly, I urged people not to buy hazelnut coffee and bring it into my office. I didn't want the it, smell. The smell is pretty strong. It's pretty okay, strong. the smell of hazelnut coffee is the best part, though. <laughs> I'm not a flavored coffee fan, but I will huff hazelnut coffee scent <laughs> any day. <laughs> Good. It's nutty. Paris, the hazelnut title. huffer. Huffing hazelnut coffee. Hazelnut. <laughs> Thank you, Paris Martineau. She's writing for, she's got a whole wall uh, taken over as she writes a massive article for the information. You must subscribe to read it, theinformation.com. Um, Thanks, guys. Yeah. This is, you know, why we do the show so that you have to listen to the very end to get what the show title yes. means. Yes. It's how we tell if you're <laughs> we a true listener. Yes, if you're, yes. And you know that you have to listen because you've got to know why. Why are they talking about huffing hazelnut coffee? <laughs> Everyone's asking this. Jeff Jarvis, he's the director uh, for one more day of the Town Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University. Newmark. How should we introduce you next week? Well, I will be all of this actually until next August. I'll be oh. on leave. And then you add one more word Emeritus. after that. Yeah. Emeritus. It could be like a very tiny one. It could be the Craig, 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 Craig Newmark, Newmark. Emeritus. Emeritus. <laughs> Can we get a new Craig Newmark with the word Emeritus at the end? <laughs> emeritus. Oh, you know, like the jingle singers where they, they do this, they call them shout jingles. It's time for Leo Laporte in the morning. And uh, <laughs> is that, is that what they do? Yes. They're, sh they're called shout jingles. Um, I actually had one. It went, build your own radio network. You've always wanted to build your own radio network. Clock <laughs> FM is you. Leo Laporte. 
because they didn't want to pay for the singers to sing your name. So it was very quick and easy for them. <laughs> they just go, now shout. Wait. Jeff what? Jarvis. Jeff Jarvis. Now shout Paris Martino. <laughs> Paris Martino. And they had the same jingle and they just shout. Oh. It's cheap jingles okay, is that what makes it was. Sense. Yeah. 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 I wish I still had my jingles. I wish you did. It'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. In the old days, we didn't save stuff as much. Thank you, Paris. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all for listening. We do this week in Google every Wednesday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. The live stream starts at the beginning of the show on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash twit, uh, and ends when the show ends. Uh, but for those of you in the club, the <laughs> the Google Trends quiz is coming, <laughs> is coming up next. Uh, after the fact, you can get the show at twit.tv slash twig. There's a YouTube channel dedicated to the edited versions of the show. Great for sharing with others. Please do let others know about the show. It, it helps us. And, of course, you can subscribe in your favorite podcast player and get it automatically the minute it's available. Have a wonderful week, everybody. We will be back next week with our last show of the year on December 20th. And then it's a best of on the 27th. And then uh, back in the saddle January third that's the schedule ahead thank you everybody we'll see you next time on this week in google